Welcome to day three of the Grad Futures Forum hosted by the Princeton University Graduate School. We're delighted you could join us for this unique online event and for important conversation re regarding graduate student professional development, especially as we are all navigating unprecedented change and uncertainties together. The main purpose of this event is to expose graduate students to a diversity of professional paths, to provide them with practical information and tangible next steps and to connect them with the amazing network of support they have available to them through the broader Princeton community. This three-day online event represents the Graduate School at Princeton University's strong commitment to preparing our graduate students with the professional skills and competencies they will need now and in the future. In just a few moments, Dean Sarah Jane Leslie will introduce our keynote speaker. Welcome and thank you all for joining us today at the Grad Futures Forum for today's session on the making of the Hi-Fi Nation podcast. I am delighted to introduce Barry Lamb, Associate Professor of Philosophy at Vassar College. In addition to publishing in top peer-reviewed journals directed towards other academics, Dr. Lamb aims to disseminate his thinking about philosophy in narrative audio form for a wider audience as the executive producer and host of Hi-Fi Nation, a show about philosophy that turns stories into ideas, and the first show weaving philosophy with narrative storytelling, investigative journalism, and sound design. From Slate Podcasts, Hi-Fi Nation begins with a story and seeks to extract big ideas, unquestioned assumptions, and unexamined conflicts in those stories. Listeners then engage in an exploration of those ideas, assumptions, and conflicts with philosophers and other scholars. Barry also gives intensive workshops in podcast production, particularly for philosophers, professors, and higher education media producers. He will share an inside look at the making of an upcoming episode of his podcast featuring a Princeton PhD alumna and will also join a Podcasting 101 panel. Please join me in welcoming Barry Lamb to the Grad Futures Forum. Hi. Welcome, Barry. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, We're so delighted to have a sneak peek at an upcoming episode and to have you walk us through all of the sort of inner workings of how you develop a podcast, uh, your career journey, how you became interested in podcasting. Thank you so much for joining us. Good. Thank you, Ava. And um, if there are questions coming from the viewing audience uh, that's appropriate for any section, just let me know and then I'll answer the question before I proceed to a following, the following section. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Great. So I guess I'll get started. And um, so I am today going to talk about making a podcast. There are so many uh, advice books, videos, uh, audios, entire podcasts about making podcasts. Um, so those it's, it's a big growing field. And uh, there's a lot of money going into it as well. Even at this time, there's a lot of people making it, probably more people making it now than, than ever. And since there's so much of that out there, I'm going to target today's presentation to academics in particular, uh, because that's the audience here at Princeton. I'm an academic, and the people who are watching this and interested in it are going to be academics. And in particular, I'm going to be talking about um, taking your academic work and turning it into something that is uh, something that the public wants to listen to and keeps coming back to. So I'm not going to be talking about, you know, you're an academic, but you have a hobby podcast about motorcycles or something like that. It's mostly about something that you started out specializing in as a PhD student or a PhD uh, 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 graduate and um, are going are, are coming to thinking about popularization. So I'm going to start by um, so, so I think my slides are on. There, there we go. Uh, I'm going to start a little bit by just um, talking about just the three main challenges that you face as an academic. Uh, the 
the slideshow is going to be mostly about the process of developing ideas and structuring an idea. And then the second half of the presentation will be about the episode in particular. That's an upcoming episode from this season, episode two on police discretion. Uh, okay, so let's start talking about generally the, the more uh, theoretical aspects, <laughs> the things that go into making a project. Uh, so the challenges of public philosophy, it's just the challenges of uh, publicizing your academic work is going to be essentially making people care about something. And if you're specialized in a field, whether it's in the humanities or the sciences, it's probably enough in the weeds that you're dealing with technical questions that are not of general interest, but are of real importance in your area. So making people care, giving them a stake in the question, right? Giving them a stake in a particular, in, the philosophy is one of those fields that has uh, had more of a challenge becoming popularized than, say, even Shakespeare or um, 19th century Victorian literature. At least you have something to hang on to. There's a style. There, there are films. There's fiction storytelling that, 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 that connects with those kinds of things. But because philosophy is about abstract questions, giving people a stake in them, um, is a challenge, and then making them come back for more instead of having one-off pieces. Uh, I had to, I wanted to design High Five Nation as a series that goes over an entire season, and then three seasons, and right now we're in the fourth season, and so we have to think. I have to think about how I'm going to make people want to subscribe and stay subscribed to um, a show. That's about philosophy. Okay, um, so let me talk a little bit about. Uh, the more general issue with academics doing popularization. And that has to do with the fact that academics are trained in a particular way to communicate in a particular way. We don't really know it until somebody from the outside points it out. So I want to present to you a quotation from another Princeton uh, graduate, the author Michael Lewis, class of 1982. He had to delve into academic psychology for the first time when he was doing research for his book, The Undoing Project, which was about Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, Daniel Kahneman being Princeton faculty as well. And he wrote in a kind of, uh, I believe it was an end note or a footnote somewhere, about what he thought uh, about reading academic papers as opposed to doing the kind of writing that he did. And what he said was, the readers of academic papers in the mind's eye of their authors are at best skeptical and more commonly hostile. The writers of these papers aren't trying to engage their readers, much less give them pleasure. They're trying to survive them. And this quotation is a very accurate characterization, not just of the writing that academics do, but the form of communication, um, what we're trained in doing, what you, when you're writing your dissertation, are doing, what you as a professional academic are uh, doing when you try to publish or when you give a talk somewhere. Um, what, you're, what we're trained to do in the academy is survive our readers, right? And that comes with it a certain conception of what our readers, our listeners, our audience is like and what they're thinking, right? And what they're thinking is something to the effect of this person needs to be challenged. This person needs to be scrutinized to the highest level. And if their ideas and if their talk survive that, then they're worth some merit. And because we're trained in that mindset, the manner in which we communicate, a lot of academics communicate, is quite different from what uh, in the popular the, the popular, it's much different than what the popular audience is like and expect from that kind of work, right? Since Michael Lewis has always written to engage and give pleasure to their readers rather than survive them, um, he recognized this feature right away. And it's something that when, if you decide to do a podcast and you decide to talk to a lot of academics, you're going to notice that academics are much more used to and comfortable in the, in the situation where they're surviving each other. Right, namely challenging each other to a high level. And that um, is uh, a recipe for success in academia, 
but probably not success in the in the era in the sphere of popularization. Um, now, why is that? Well, I mean, it's it's because people who are coming to podcasts or popular works of of writing uh, are not necessarily there to challenge the person who's writing to them or speaking to them. Um, and because of that, they're, uh, the kind of product that you're engineering towards an audience is very different from the kind of product you're engineering to uh, an academic audience that you're trying to survive. Um, and this is something that I think popularizers who are journalists know very well. The flip side, the downside to that, is that popularizers who are journalists are not as attuned to the subtleties of academic work in a way that people, they might get wrong or incorrect or something that their um, that academics would say to the effect of that isn't quite right and that's misleading to the public. So what I think academics can provide is um, a kind of subtlety to particular topics and issues that as academics, they recognize how complicated they are and how in that complication, they don't want to mislead the public. But at the same time, what I think academics need to do is recognize that in doing popularization, you're not writing to an audience that you're trying to survive. So, so I want to talk a little bit about designing a podcast that, that accomplishes these kinds of things. Um, so uh, let me talk a little bit about the difference between engineering and architecture for a second. Um, there's this fascinating and persistent division of labor in many types of creative activities. Um, and that's the distinction between the engineer and the architect, right? The engineer is essentially responsible for the structural tenability and efficient production of say a building, right? And the architect is responsible for its aesthetic features. Um, and it's an oversimplification, of course. Um, architects know a lot about engineering and vice versa, but it's a useful distinction. And it's a distinction we see in a lot of other areas. For instance, we see it in the distinction between the nutritionist and the chef. Um, we see it in the distinction between the producer and the director of a film. We see it in the distinction between the framing carpenter who uh, builds the structure of the house and the finished carpenter who does the molding and the baseboard and things like that. And when you think about what it is that academics do that's different from the uh, popular nonfiction, say, um, some people say, well, academics can't write, right? They're bad at writing and then other people are better at writing. That, I think that's generally true, but I don't think that characterizes fully accurately Right, because when we talk about good writing, most of the time we're talking about good architecture. Right, um, good writing is the quotable things, things like the sparkle of the prose, images, metaphors, um, use of words, things like that. Um, but I think the key difference is not with architecture; the key is with engineering. The academic writing is engineered to do something that's quite different from um, popular nonfiction. And this is true of writing, and this is true of podcasts as well. And so what is it that um, academics are engineered to do? Well, they're engineered, um, essentially, sorry, um, academics, uh, academic work is engineered to essentially present evidence for the truth of hypotheses, right? You're engineering yourself. What it means to survive a reader, survive a reviewer, is for you to present your methods as the best methods, your evidence, your data as the best data to support a particular hypothesis, right? The engineering is essentially an epistemic task, which is it's a task designed to show that you are fully justified in presenting what it is that you're presenting as truth, whether it's in sciences or uh, math or the academy. Um, there are people who are good writers at it, but essentially you're producing in such, you're producing, you're engineering a product that survives the scrutiny with respect to truth or justification. Whereas the popular nonfiction um, writer is not engineering that way at all, right? Instead, they're engineering for something different. They're, some, they're engineering their work 
to, well, engagement is the word that people use, but really they're tapping into a different part of human psychology. The human psycho the, the part of psychology that academics are um, engineering their work for is the part that challenges evidence. It's the part that challenges methods. It's the part that questions a conclusion, right? The part that uh, popular nonfiction writers are engaging are the is the part that is engaged with storytelling, right? At least that's what um, my hypothesis is. And there's no better way to see this, I think, than to look at people who are incredibly good at engineering for the storytelling part, but incredibly bad at the architecture of it, right? If you look at the two biggest bestsellers for adults of the last 20 years, um, what are they? Uh, they are, I think, uh, The Da Vinci Code and Fifty Shades of Grey. Uh, I think that those um, are two works that people, academics, uh, critics like Jeff Pullum would say, are horribly written. Right? The architecture is absolutely awful, and yet they've sold more books than probably the totality of all of Western philosophy in the last 1,000 years. Um, so, uh, so Je a quote from Jeff Pullum, um, Dan Brown's writing is not just to, you know, to knock down Dan Brown, but Dan Brown's writing is not just bad, it's staggeringly, clumsily, thoughtlessly, almost ingeniously bad, and yet people keep coming back to Dan Brown. Now, why, why is that? Because Dan Brown's an incredibly good engineer, even if he's just a horrible architect. And uh, I have this little quote just to, just as a joke. Um, this is this is sort of one of the quotations from Dan Brown that that Pullum pulled, seemingly at random. Um, to, as an example, uh, ph physicist Leonardo Vitra smelled burning flesh, and he knew it was his own. Um, another quote from. Uh, 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 James, Fifty Shades of Grey. Um, uh, this is a, a PG quote. I feel the color in my cheeks rising again. I must be the color of the Communist Manifesto. Um, these are supposed to be egregiously bad pieces of architecture, but really good engineering in that millions and millions and millions of people around the world are buying, reading these books. There are um, uh, movies and uh you know, more people know about that than they do about Immanuel Kant. Okay, so as I said, academic writing is engineered towards epistemic justifications, obsessed with evidence, it's sensitive to misunderstandings, problems, and objections. Uh, the target reader is your reviewer. And what I want to suggest is that your podcast, if it does too much of this, it's going to be targeted for other academics or other wannabe academics. Right? And that's okay if that's the kind of podcast you want to make. If you want to make a peer-facing podcast in the same way that you write for peers, right? you want your podcast to do a, more of this right? Uh, and to do this well. But if you want to do something more than that, then you have to be sensitive to the balance between engineering something with this aim and engineering something for the aim of engagement, which taps into the storytelling side of people, okay? So, uh, you know, popular writing, popular podcasts, what are they engineered to do, right? They're going to be sensitive to different things. They're gonna be sensitive to boredom and inattention. They're gonna be sensitive to incomprehensibility. They're gonna be sensitive to essentially, essentially aesthetic reactions, right? Um, pleasure, joy. Um, their target reader is not a reviewer, but a consumer, somebody who can easily go to something else, right, if they don't like what it is that you're placing in front of them. Okay, so uh, so the so the insight that I think that the podcasting community uh, is presenting um, to us in the last few years is that um, human beings seem to be wired for primarily story. Um, a small subset of human beings are wired very well for justification. They tend to be in academia. They tend to get PhDs. But if you uh, want to branch out, you have to be a lot more sensitive to what most people do and consume outside of that context, right? 65% of human speech is gossip. It's people talking about other people doing things that are titillating or interesting to people. It's usually not about 
um, how those other people, um, you know, ran an analysis uh, on their data set. Um, so what's a story? A story has a character in it. It has a plot. It has a conflict. It has stakes. Um, it has a change in fortune over time for that character, right? And it has suspense. What's suspense? It's suspense is the withholding of information at crucial moments, information that you want to get later. These are the kind of things that I think that uh, a good integration of storytelling with academic ideas requires, right? So what does that preclude? It precludes the academic tendency to lay out everything up front, right? So for instance, Today, I'm going to tell you about this. First, A is going to happen, B is going to happen, and then I'm going to use that to make an argument about C, right? This is sort of um, what's good about academic presentation may be bad for um, storytelling. Okay, so that was all the abstract stuff, right? Now, you want to um, find the right story when you have the right idea. So what is it that you want to present? Well, I do a philosophy show. So it's usually going to be, I'm going to start with something in philosophy, right? Uh, and this is just a, uh, an example. Um, this is a rather pedantic literature in philosophy about the issue of vagueness in language. And what vagueness in language just is, is that um, there are these terms in our language that um, um, express things we understand but there are certain situations where they kind of break down, right? So one great example of this is like the word tall, we know what that means. We know what a tall person is, a tall building is, but it kind of breaks down in like the middling cases, like is somebody who's five foot 10 tall? So this is a pedantic literature in philosophy. Um, and there's a scholar who, um, Roy Sorensen, who writes a lot about this. And there's a, I'm presenting here a quote from the beginning of one of his papers, uh, and it already presents an interesting issue, right? So I'm going to read this here. Uh, Islamic building codes require mosques to face Mecca. And if you um, um, know your Islam, right, it's precisely because um, uh, Muslims have to face Mecca in their prayers a few times a day. Um, the further Islam spreads, the more apt are believers to fall into a quandary. X faces Y only when the front of X is closer to Y than any other side of X. So that is a very academic philosopher's way of writing about presenting an issue, right? Using variables. So the front of the mosque should be oriented along a shortest path to Mecca. Which way is that? Does the path to Mecca tunnel through the earth or the path follow the surface of the earth? Contemporary Western legal theorists are apt to dismiss this enigma on the grounds that there's no right answer. The Islamic system has no room for this kind of discretion. Islamic law is a divine command theory. An act is illegal exactly when God forbids it. Since God is never undecided, every legal question has a determinate answer. The judge's aim is to discover what God's judgment is. Right? Sorensen begins this article, and he's trying to argue for something. Right? He's trying to argue something to the effect of, um, there is a fact of the matter of when say a building is on the other side of the earth from Mecca, which way is it supposed to face in order to face Mecca? Is it north, is it east, is it south, or is it west? He thinks that there's a fact of the matter that we are there to discover. So pedantic philosophical question. For a podcast episode about this, right? I'm not going to just interview Roy Sorensen and then discuss all the ins and outs of the academic arguments about this issue because you can go, that's what a paper is for, right? You have a debate, you see the people on the other side of Sorensen's um, position, you interview them, and then you present some kind of debate. That, like, that's a podcast that's aimed towards an academic audience. For the popular audience who might not care about this issue, I want to find a story with a character, a plot, uh, a conflict and a change in fortune over time. So what did I find? I haven't done this show yet, right? I found um, Sheikh Shukor of Malaysia, one of the first Muslim astronauts, and his dilemma, he wanted to pray regularly from space and wanted to face Mecca from space in order to do that. If you uh, know anything about uh, how space travel works, you're essentially orbiting the Earth and every 16 minutes you do one, uh, you do you make one orbit around the Earth, right? And it takes I don't know how long, a few minutes to 
for a particular prayer. From start to finish, as you're moving, the distance between uh, uh, the shuttle and Mecca is going to be changing and your orientation is going to be changing. And he wanted to know what direction he should be facing at every any given start of prayer. And what happened was, if you look up this story, which came out, you know, um, many years ago now, um, the um, the Muslim community had to have a conference in which a group of mathematicians, as well as a group of theologians, had to write out uh, a set of guidelines as to how astronauts were to pray and were to diet um, in the course of uh, of spaceflight, um, and that's the story. That's the story that's connected to that particular issue, right? So if I made an episode about that particular issue in philosophy, I would try to get um, uh, uh, Mr. Shakur, I would try to get participants from the conference where the Islamic scholars were um, thinking about and um, going through the process of calculating how he uh, prayed, and then eventually talk about how he did end up praying from space. And interweaved with that would be the would be the philosophical issue about discovering the meaning of a term versus inventing the meaning of a term versus thinking that a term doesn't have a specific meaning. Okay, so that's the example of one particular story: how to find and connect a story with uh, a philosophical issue. Uh, Ava, do we have any questions about this before I proceed to talk about? particular episodes yes let's let's check the chat and see which which questions we have coming in um i i have a a quick question um we have um really what i i think one one of the questions perhaps we'll probably get to later in the in the show is really what how did you uh, come to find podcasting, uh, you know, as as an interesting way to tell your story and to share, uh, you know, philosophical uh, information. You know, you framed for us how you're you have a different sort of storytelling, a different style of writing, and, and et cetera. But how how did you come to uh, become passionate about podcasting? I think that audio is a very powerful medium for a certain form of communication. Um, audio is very intimate. It's in mostly people listen to it in their ears, right? <laughs> when they're alone, right? They don't listen to it really in a group. Uh, I, I, it's a, it's an area which I'm very fond of um, myself. It's, it's very, very powerful for me. And it's also one of these things where I think that audio, um, there, there's something about print where you lose the you lose an aspect of humanity when you listen. <laughs> it's not really terrible, but um, telling somebody's story in print doesn't sound anywhere like listening to the person tell their story, mm -hmm. right? And um, you know, there's the flip side to that, right? So um, the flip side to that is that um, print can hide, for instance. Um, somebody who's really bad at presenting ideas <laughs> um, and you can um, people who make you fall asleep or you can't follow them. But in print, after having that person shared an idea with you, you can go back and um, uh, re you can edit it, right? You can edit mm -hmm. it in a way that makes it presentable. Audio allows you to do a little bit of all of that. Um, you can edit in audio uh, mm -hmm. and you can also, hear the passion in somebody's voice, um, the timbre of their voice, the way that things have affected them. So I think it's powerful in that way. And, and also, you know, it's practically speaking, it's a lot easier than, say, video, um, yeah. it's easier to edit than video. So I, I, we have another another question is really how how has podcasting uh, informed as well your your conversation with other academics? So of course podcasting can bring um, the you know philosophy to a broader audience. Um, but when you 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 spoke earlier about ways that you engage with 
fellow academics in a different sort of dialogue, but has podcasting influenced that in some way? Absolutely. Here's something that you, there are two ways it's influenced my engagement with other academics. Number one is um, there's a norm, I think, of asking other, other academics to send you their papers. There isn't really a norm of asking other academics to sit with you for an hour, hour and a half just to talk with you to have them present their ideas to you. The podcasting context allows you to do that. Uh, it's There's a good excuse to do that. Um, they, they have a reason to do that because their ideas would be presented somewhere else. Um, another way that it's in... Um, it's influenced is that the um, other acad it, it, it's made me have to and and it's been a wonderful experience engage with academics that are nowhere near my field the season mm -hmm. I'm the entire season of philosophy and criminal justice and I've spoken to law professors judges um, uh, criminologists that I would not have I might have read their work and learned from their work but it's very different to sit with them for an hour and have a discussion um, about their ideas in an interview that I then have to listen to 10, 20 times as I edit them uh, to yeah. put it into a documentary type format. So those are two of the major influences. Yeah, yeah, that's that's great. I, I know we had another question from a, a student in the humanities who was interested in how they might start a podcast as a first year PhD in the humanities. Um, and I know you have lots of information uh, to share on this. <laughs> um, I would say it depends on the kind of podcast you want to make. Um, the kind of thing that I make is incredibly labor intensive. Uh, and I would recommend for younger people, if they wanted to make the kind of thing that I make, rather than start your own, make pieces that you can then, you know, like it would be like, should I start a magazine or should I write articles for one, right? I would say if you're interested in the kind of narrative, story-driven, high production things and learning how to make that kind of thing, and you're a first-year PhD student, I would say aim to make one 20-minute piece a year and try to get it put on other shows. Think about it as writing articles for a magazine rather than starting your own magazine. If you want to just sit around with a bunch of your friends and just talk about something, and so for every hour that you put out there, um, you have it takes you an hour to record, go right ahead. It's not that much work. Um, probably not a lot of people other than your friends and family are going to listen to it, but um, I would like by all means, go ahead and do that. That's great. Um, uh, if we we want, we can uh, proceed with the presentation and we'll just see how more questions come in and we'll let you know as, as more questions come into the chat. Okay, great. great. Um, so before I go to the specific episode that I'm going to talk about today, I wanted to talk about some of the, the things that you have to learn to do when you're trying to make a narrative and academic podcast. And the most, imp the most difficult thing um, that you have to uh, do is structure. Structuring just means how do you present the story? In what order? Is it chronological? Is it in medias res? All the action comes first and you go backwards. Where do you pr present the academic stuff in the context of your story? And so on and so forth. That's always the hardest thing for anything, whatever you're doing in this, in this medium. Um, so the first thing to know is, um, and, and this is not unique, you can find it out there, uh, people talk about this elsewhere, is the first five minute rule, which is that you have to have the listener in the first five minutes. Um, if you don't have them for the first five minutes, they're not going to continue with this episode, and they're probably not going to continue with your podcast. Um, but if you do, if they make it through the first five minutes, all the data shows that you probably have them for the rest of the podcast. Not everybody, but like 75 to 90% of people. If you have them through the first five, you have them for the rest of the show. So the first five minutes is, um, so the idea of a hook is really important in this medium, uh, this, this genre in the medium. Uh, so, uh, that and that's the that's the kind of formula that I follow, right? The um, the opening of an episode about um, uh, Mr. Shakur, the Muslim actor, Dr. Shakur, the Muslim astronaut, is not going to begin with uh, opening that Roy Sorensen wrote. It's going to begin with the story of the Muslim astronaut, right? Okay. Um, 
Then the other thing is, oops, okay. So this is just a diagram. You're going to find this out there in, in a lot of um, storytelling uh, structure uh, uh, presentations. And I'm just going to very briefly talk about what these diagrams are. Um, and these are diagrams that are visual representations of the structure of a story. And in the, the particular diagrams that I showed you here, these are the examples of the structure of the relationship between a story and an intellectual issue, right? So if I, for me, it's a philosophical issue. It might be a, uh, a scientific issue if you're a PhD in other um, fields. And so the horizontal lines that you see here represents sort of the, uh, so this is the simplest story structure, right? All this represents is the horizontal line is just, this is the story, right? Um, in chronological order, right? A happens, B happens, C happens, D happens. And then he wanted to learn how he should pray for, to Mecca from space, right? And then you have the trough, right? Or a curve, which is the philosophical issue, right? How are you supposed to answer that question, right? Well, one group decided to have a whole conference about, you know, so on. And then you have this scholar saying that you answer it this way, and this scholar saying you answer it this way. What's the debate about it? So on and so forth, and you end, right? The episode that I, um, I put out today that I'm going to talk about has this very simple structure, right? It's just story and then academics, right? The story motivates the academic issue, and then you talk about the academic issue, right? Um, I'm just going to talk about one more structure here, right? So this second structure is, um, is just a structure where you cut off the story at a certain strategic point, right? And what that generates in, in, um, uh, in the technical uh, jargon is you generate need to know, right? People always want to come back and finish a story, even if it's story that, a story they don't care about. Um, and so you cut off it at a precise point where you think somebody's want to come back to the story, and then you present all of the intellectual issues surrounding um, the story in the middle, and then you continue with the story until the end, right? That's another kind of structure. There's all kinds of other structures um, that I have here. I don't want to, you know, um, get into too much of the weeds for it, but this works in print. Some of these work well in print. Some of these work very well in audio. Um, I have a paper that's out there. You can just Google about what all of these different structures mean. But these are kind of shapes. These are kind of guidelines in how you integrate storytelling with um, a academic piece, right, with academic ideas. OK. Uh, let's see. Um, OK. And finally, uh, this form uses music, right? And it uses music strategically. Um, because the form that I work in is uh, closely related to, if not identical to, documentary, right? Whether it's documentary film or documentary audio, um, we, you have to be sensitive to the power and, um, and influence of music in the aesthetic quality, not only of the story, but in the ideas, right? It's, it's amazing just the kind of human mind that we have, how much scoring, um, meaning scoring music, underlying even a scholar talking about something has a dramatic effect on how well people, how people understand it, how well they, they absorb it. Um, and when I talk about music, I'm only just, I don't just mean music. I also mean spacing and silence punctuated by music, right? So, um, Story and music go incredibly well together because they're both kind of temporal, right? They unfold over time. Um, and the quality of the change over time kind of affects how you appreciate a story and how you affects, uh, affects how you appreciate music. So um, we, uh, the, the term in documentary film is non-diegetic music. The non-diegetic music just means music that's inserted into it, that it's clear that it's inserted into it. It's not music that's being played by somebody in the scene of a film, for instance. Like if somebody's playing in the music, it's diegetic music. But non-diegetic music underscores the action and underscores the narration, um, right? So these are some of the things that it does, right? It creates movement. That's gonna be important, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, Music requires resolution in a way that story does as well. So if you are left dangling, right, you, you don't have um, a chord resolved, right, then that's something that they talk about in music theory, right? It creates moods. 
most importantly, it allows for silence and pause for thinking. If you're doing a dense academic podcast, one thing not to do is to present it as though you're presenting a talk mm -hmm. because listeners need time sometimes to take in what it is that's being said. You can also engineer that. If you think something important is about to be said or has just been said, leaving blank space before and after uh, is a way of doing that. Audio doesn't have paragraph marker. It doesn't have italics. It doesn't have um, new sections. So one of the ways to signal those kinds of sections and those kinds of changes is through the use of music, right? Um, suspension without discomfort, all that means is that you are allowing without the awkwardness of silence, right? And, um, and music does that for you. Okay, so um, a couple of rules of thumb on how to use music. Uh, so rule of thumb, music in audio is far more subtle than in video. If you watch a feature film or even a documentary film, and you try to use the exact same kind of music for a podcast, it doesn't quite work. It's too grand, right? So you want music in audio to be a, a lot more subtle than, say, John Williams and, and Star Wars score, right? For academic purposes, um, what you want to think about when you think about music is what kind of thing is being presented by an academic or by you in a certain section. So for instance, Sometimes you have to present something that's boring but necessary, right? What I mean by that is something like, in philosophy, there's a lot of boring but necessary things, like things like, let me tell you about a distinction. Here's the distinction between um, tokens and types. And you're, you're presenting some kind of vocabulary there. It's important for something that comes next in your episode or your, your piece. Um, you have to get through it, but you understand that it's going to be a little pedantic. So what you want is you want a rhythm to the music that allows um, motion, right? Think about the idea of uh, a train that's moving slowly versus quickly. You want to be able to pace the music underneath an ex explanation like that to aid in the comprehension. Um, you want music to highlight big deal moments in the presentation of an idea, something that is of particular insight that you as a scholar know is very insightful that somebody who's listening might not recognize how big of a deal that is, right? Um, then you want um, uh, music to sort of highlight that. Sometimes you want music to, to do something that, um, that uh, light motifs do, which is to relate certain ideas that are being talked about by a scholar with something that happened in the story. So you might use the same piece of music, the same motif in both areas. Right? And I already talked about allowing section markers, paragraphs, and allowing space to think. For storytelling purposes, there's a lot you can look up. Transom.org is a good place to find how the professionals like to score when they score stories. Okay, uh, 43 minutes, so 43, okay, good. We're, we're, we're in good shape. So what I wanna do now is I want to talk about the specific episode one specific episode that's forthcoming from this season. So I'm going to stop the screen here, and I'm going to present uh, a, uh, a, diff a different screen. Um, I am going to present, let's say, um, just give me a little bit of time to find it on the desktop. OK. Sure, sure. Um, Barry, we do have another uh, question as you're, you're looking for that. Uh, a, a student is uh, interested in podcasting, but sort of nervous about making mistakes. Um, any, any lessons learned from your early days in podcasting? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, the thing about podcasting is that you don't have to put out a mistake if you made it. <laughs> <laughs> in such a way that makes you sound great. And that's exactly what I do to this day. Uh, and it's true of your guests too. So if you don't mind doing editing, then you could just present yourself and, um, and other people very, um, very smartly. Uh, any lessons, other lessons learned from the early days in podcasting? I would say that the biggest lesson is 
do it. Don't think about doing it. If you really want to do it, um, you can drown yourself in advice and go-to guides. If you're really motivated, do it. Give yourself a month. If you don't like it, at least you tried. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. It, it's it there there are risks involved, of course, you know, and you you just really make make it um you know a learn it's a learning experiment in the beginning, but you, you're right. You it's within your control what you put out there publicly. Well, you don't have to air the episode, for instance. Okay, so here is uh I'm going to, I'm just going to share some word documents mm -hmm. to show you uh, this is how the sausage is actually made <laughs> the episode that I put out there. Some of you might have listened to it or watching this. Some of you might not. I'm presenting this. This is going to be the second episode of this season. It's coming out on May 8th. I'm presenting this because this episode just had two voices, two guests. That's pretty rare for an episode of, uh, of Hi-Fi Nation, usually three or four sometimes even 20. Um, but there's only two guests on this, and neither guest ha gave first personal stories um, that fit with the philosophical issue of the episode. What's the philosophical issue of the episode? The episode is about the use of police discretion. Police discretion is those things that police are not obligated to do, but they have the right to say, write a ticket or let somebody go, to arrest somebody or let them go, um, to pursue you know, the enforcement of some laws, but not other laws, right? Um, and the philosophical issue that comes from that is what are the better and worse ways for police to use discretion? What is supposed to guide them in their use of such discretion? Uh, I interviewed Brandon Del Pozo, uh, Brandon Del Pozo was the chief of police of Burlington, Vermont. He also went and got a PhD in philosophy because he was interested in this particular question. I went up and I spoke to him for about, you know, two and a half hours. Okay. Uh, after that two and a half hours, the whole thing gets transcribed with a little help from software and uh, research assistants. And what you get is this thing right here. This is the unedited full transcript. 42 pages, right? As I'm scrolling through this, people see that, right? I'm just scrolling through 42 pages. You'll see some highlighted because I just went through it of, of just text of an exchange, right? And what goes on in an interview like that? Well, I first read his dissertation. I took notes. I went in and I asked him to explain things in the dissertation. I challenged him on some things. I asked him to explain things many different ways one way I would have thought made when, when he first said it, I thought, okay, that's not perfectly clear. I think that if an undergraduate were listening to that, they wouldn't quite understand it. And I would say something like, did you mean it like this? And then he'll say it in a different way. I might actually tell him to say it in a different way and so on. That's why you have say a 42 page, right. Um, interview here. Okay. So this thing is time stamped. So you see 30 seconds here, um, whatever it is, six minutes, 38 seconds here, and so on. And what that allows me to do is when I go back to the audio, I'll know exactly where to find a particular quote, a particular moment, OK? So that's Brandon Del Pozo. Um, you know, the other person that I interviewed for this was Sarah Sayo. Yeah. Sarah is a Princeton undergrad and graduate. I yeah. think. <laughs> and I found Sarah through the Princeton Alumni Magazine because I was working on this season. I didn't have any stories about police discretion. Mm -hmm. Now, what would I? What was I looking for? I, I didn't know what I was looking for at first, right? You don't know what you're looking for. Um, so what I did was I started with, so I said, okay, there's something really interesting about Sarah's book. His, her book is about the history of the Fourth Amendment as it pertains to the automobile and the way police can or can't search cars. I read the book, it's a great book. I called Sarah up, we sat down for about an hour and you have um, the interview with Sarah, which is 21 pages rather than 42 pages. Right? That's what you see here. Okay, so after all that, 
after all of those two things, right, I still didn't have a story. Sarah's a historian, a legal historian. And Sarah had stories she told about Supreme Court cases that uh, happened, but they happened in 1916. They happened in 1925. They happened in 1964 and so on. Um, and so all of the highlights that you see in each of the transcripts are the things that I highlighted when I went through the transcripts a few times to see what I think could go in the show. Things that are the most interesting parts of the interviews I did with both. Um, after all of that, I still didn't have a story. Um, what would have been ideal would have been to find a plaintiff in one of these Supreme Court cases, a very recent one, that had to do with the Fourth Amendment, that had to do with um, the police use of discretion and searches in a car. There's something really compelling about people who were pulled over by a cop, searched, then arrested, and then something happened to them. And then they got connected with an ACLU lawyer who took the case up to the Supreme Court and argued. There's something very dramatic. That's why there's so many great legal shows about that. The ideal story would have been to find an individual who faced um, an issue with the police that was then litigated up to the Supreme Court and decided in a certain way that would have uh, changed things in the relationship between the police and the people. Yeah. The problem is that most of those things happened very early on in American history. And also the other problem was that in all of the recent cases, those cases wouldn't have fit very well um, with the episode. So what did I decide to do? I decided to see what I could find from, um, uh, sorry, okay, uh, I'll, okay. Uh, what I decided to do was I tried to look at um, uh, Supreme Court cases that we had audio archives of. Um, and I found many of those kinds of cases. And so in order to fit the five minute rule, what I decided to do was I chose one of those cases as the opening story for this episode. And if the episodes, um, so out of those two interviews um, and maybe a half dozen Supreme Court cases that I listened through about an hour worth of argument, I had one case that was, I then cut into a three minute story that was the hook story, which I'll play for you now. Okay. Charles Carney lived out of a mobile home in San Diego in 1979. He was in his 50s and he wasn't a good dude. Carney would park his mobile home around town and target young boys. On one of these occasions, May 31st, he walked up to a young Mexican boy on the street and started talking, but it happened to catch the attention of two DEA agents in the area. Agent Robert Williams of the Drug Enforcement Administration witnessed Mr. Carney's contact with the young man and watched Mr. Carney and the boy go into the vehicle. He noticed the license plate on the vehicle and recalled that he had specific information regarding this vehicle. You're listening to audio from oral arguments at the U.S. Supreme Court in 1984 about Carney's arrest. Louis Hanoyan is arguing for the state. What happened was that the two DEA agents watching Carney intercepted the boy on his way out. The boy told them that he had just been given drugs in exchange for sex with Carney. At that point in time, they asked the boy to come back to the motorhome with them. The boy did that. He knocked on the door of the motorhome. Mr. Carney stepped out. Agent Clem looked into the motorhome, saw two bags of a green leafy substance, which was later identified to be marijuana. Agent Clem reported what he saw to Agent Williams, who placed Mr. Carney under arrest. It's what happened next that is under contention at the Supreme Court. Carney was already arrested, and the agents had probable cause that drug and sex crimes had taken place inside of the mobile home. But could they search the home without first getting a warrant? The agents didn't consider it. Agent Williamson drove the van to the Narcotics Task Force headquarters and then searched the van. In the course of the search, they found a total of about 
two pounds of marijuana in the refrigerator and in some cupboards, in addition to the two bags that were found on the table. It turned out that the DEA's warrantless search turned up all of the evidence they could get to charge Carney with the crime. The boy who was the victim, he disappeared, most likely because he was an undocumented Mexican national not looking for any more contact with the system. They had no other specific evidence to charge Carney with sex crimes. The motorhome was parked, the drapes were closed, it contained upholstered furniture, it contained all of the indicia of a home. This case, the Carney case, hinged on a super deep philosophical question. But it's not the one you think. It's the question of whether a mobile home was a house or a car. Is it that the vehicle had wheels? Self-propelled. It has to be self-propelled. Yes, I would agree so with that. So you wouldn't apply your thought to a trailer parked in it? Not when it's parked, no. What if the vehicle is in one of these mobile home parks and hooked up to water and electricity? What would you do with a houseboat? A houseboat? You see, if you wanted to know the boundaries of American police power, you have to figure out what counts as a car. What about a camper's tent? The motorhome would be subject to search, but then the but tent... But not the tent. Not the tent. Why wouldn't the tent be just as mobile as, as a self-propelled vehicle? I get it. Pull it down for doesn't the doesn't have wheels. It the back. Right. <laughs> That's right. It doesn't have wheels, Your Honor. <laughs> yeah, but it's, you can surely move it just as fast. It is movable. I, mean, I should think your reasoning would apply. I'm not saying you're right or wrong. Well, I, I think the reasoning does... From Slate, this is Hi-Fi Nation. Philosophy in story form. This season, crime and punishment. Recording from Vassar College, here's your host, Barry Lamb. I was surprised last year when I looked into the history of American policing and discovered that in addition to the history of slavery, segregation, urbanization, and the war on drugs, cars played just as big a role. I'd even argue that in the judicial system, it played the largest one. This is that story. I'm Sarah Sayo. I'm an associate professor of law at Iowa Law School. Okay, so that was the first four minutes. That was my attempt at getting the hook story that will open into Sarah's history of Fourth Amendment policing. I thought the story had everything. It had a bad guy. It had a search. You were trying to, there had people that you were trying to root for, people you were rooting against. And it also had all of these fascinating questions and discussions that the Supreme Court justices had. Um, the narration didn't all have to come from me. The uh, lawyers who were litigating have to um, summarize a case when they're before the court as well. So I had that audio. And so that's what I used. The next best thing to a first person story. Okay, so uh, I am going to pause for now um, on the making of this particular episode. If we have some time, we'll get to it. But I know there are a lot of questions out there. Let's take some questions. Our next, qu our next question is coming in from uh, a PhD student, Annabelle. Um, I think they're queuing it up here. Yes. How long did it take for your podcast to pick up and gain a lot of listeners? Uh, it depends on what you mean by a lot. Um, <laughs> to, um, by the end of the first season, with just word of mouth and using the networks that I had, which included Princeton, I may have had about 8,000 per episode, something like that. And then that summer, um, Slate Culture Gab Fest, which is a movie review, TV review show at Slate, reviewed the show and they loved it. <laughs> I mean, like I, I owe almost all of my listenership to them because they just said, you know, one of the one of the people said, oh, this is better than This American Life and Radio Lab, which is not true. It's not better than those. But that's what they said. <laughs> on on the, and then it rocketed to something like 30, 40,000, you know, in one day. Uh, yeah. And then stays sort of at that level. It's, about, it's, it's, it's like that. It's something like that right now. Mm -hmm. Some episodes can have really high downloads. Um, yeah. So it's really about a matter of putting it out there and getting the right people to review it. So, you know, another question is, you know, how do you think about the themes for each of your, uh, you know, so as, as you're thinking about uh, your episodes, um, the themes, like, it seems like you're almost always 
look, looking out for interesting stories that connect now with crime and punishment. So um, can you can you sort of walk us through how you you come up with what the theme might be? Is it that you find a source or something inspires you and you think, okay, that would be a great theme now to sort of structure several podcasts around? Um, or yeah, could you walk us through that process? Okay, there's two ways. Um, one way is it comes from my head. This is what I'm interested in. This is what I'm curious about. And as I uh, think about it, um, I'm going to do research into it. It's just like graduate school, right? It's just like getting a PhD. Um, that's rare though. That's only happened maybe 10% um, of the episodes that I've done. Uh, more, It's more typical for me to start with a uh, a subject matter or come across an article or something that people um, have done and then decide, I want to talk to that person, right? So for instance, if it's um, a philosopher, I might, I might like email them or call them up. Hey, can I interview you about this thing that you wrote or this thing you're writing about? Or if it's somebody who there was an article about in the, in, you know, if it was this judge made this interesting decision, can I talk to the judge? And if I talk to the judge, it's like, yeah, there actually is a philosophical issue underlying what this judge said in this case. Who's written about it? Then I try to look up the literature. Oh, actually, there's only two philosophers who have written about this issue. Let me contact them. Um, that's more typical of what happens. I contact them, and then I let my curiosity follow me, right? I contact them, and from there, I say, like, well, this is the kind of thing that's raised by this. Has anybody talked about this? Has this happened to anyone in the world? Um, so you just kind of follow where your curiosity leads, but it always begins somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. I wanted to make it about criminal justice. So I started with what kind of philosophical issues in criminal justice am I interested in? Turns out I didn't do that many of them this season because the curiosity led to other places. Mm -hmm. um, another, another question that, that we had come in was around the intersection. Oh, we're, go we're going to a different one, but, but let me give you this one as well. Intersection between sort of the storytelling and journalism. Um, do, you, do you see that there are similarities there or do you see these as very distinct and different? No, sometimes the storytelling that you do doesn't require that much journalism, right? So for instance, the Supreme Court thing, it doesn't require you to do a lot of digging. It doesn't require you to have a lot of sourcing. It was just you know, essentially that was historical research, right? You're looking at the Supreme Court archives and listening through cases, reading through cases and finding the story there. So it depends on the story that you're telling. If you're doing a deep dive issue into a current event, you might have to do some journalism, some reporting. You might have to go out there and talk to people around the ground that things are happening to. So then that's that form of storytelling is quite different from if you were doing a more history-based. I've had some history-based mm -hmm. um, shows that require you to talk to, say, historians, right? People who have happened to are long dead. Mm -hmm. Great. I think we have one, one more question coming in. Um, so from John A., how is your show received by fellow academics? Do fellow philosophers talk to you about your podcasts at academic conferences? Uh, I think that it really depends on the philosopher and the community, right? So anything that you do, even as an academic, is going to be ignored by some people and of interest to other people, mm -hmm. right? So there are going to be academics, philosophers who don't know who I am, never heard of me, and don't care. Um, there are people who, like, there are podcast listeners, right, who are also academics, and they know who I am, and they'll talk to me about things. And they'll, they'll, there are people, philosophers who are like, I have the perfect thing for your show. And I'll be like, great, let's go talk about it, right? Um, and then there are people who just don't understand what a podcast is. I've had a senior philosopher come up to me and says, I hear you have a blog, congratulations, you know? Um, so they don't know what, and they don't care. And so it really depends on the, the, the academic community. So yes, they're gonna be just like everything else. Some subset who know who I am or wanna talk to me about it, some who wanna be on the show, some who don't know and don't care, and so on. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we have we have another question coming in from uh, James M. What other academic podcasts would you recommend? Academic podcasts. Uh, wow, um, there's so many that I <laughs> um, depends on what qualifies as academic. So I have a, a 
a good friend, Chenjirai Kumanika, who is a media studies professor at um, uh, Rutgers. And he and another friend, John Bewin, they have a show called Seen on Radio. Seen on Radio they, is, um, is not billed as a history show, but it's essentially an American history. And it's, it's essentially a, a history podcast, um, mostly centered around American history, but, but also around uh, gender issues one season. But it's really um, John and sometimes Chen Jirai following their own curiosity. Um, Chen Jirai is an academic. John isn't. Um, Jill Lepore has a podcast coming out. I'm sure it's going to be great. I haven't listened to it yet because it hasn't been out yet. Um, there was this great show about history called um, Backstory. But of course, there are a lot of shows that are not called, are not done by academics, but are on academic topics, right? Freakonomics Radio is about economics. It features a lot of economics on it. It's run by a journalist, a very good one. Um, uh, Invisibilia is a show that's about um, cognitive and social psychology. They don't say it's a psychology show, but every episode is going to be about some topic they talk to a scholar about. If you look in a lot of, you know, Radio Lab, if you look at a lot of shows, a lot of them done by journalists, very good journalists, rely on academic work, right? They're trying to teach people something. Um, all I'm doing is I'm, as the academic, making one myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so we, we have another question from uh, Bora, PhD candidate, who asks, how do you monetize the medium of podcasting? How is this a sustainable model? Or do you approach this like a startup? Uh, that's a good question, and there's an entire industry built around that now, the monetization of podcasting. Um, the, um, the short answer is you do it through advertisement, your advertising, and advertisers are only going to be interested in if you have a sufficient number of downloads. Um, things are consolidating in such a way that there are major networks and companies that are going to probably dominate if, once they, if they survive COVID. Um, they're probably going to dominate, like anything else in entertainment, if there's uh, um, things are always changing in this in the in the new media um, for academics, Bora, if you're a PhD person and or people who want to do something like what I'm doing or their own show where it's just a talk show, it's not as fancy. I would say, don't think of it as a thing to monetize to try to make money or supplement an income or anything like that. Um, it's not really going to happen. Um, yes, you can try to sell ads, unless you're a huge production studio with a huge network to market it at. Um, you're probably not going to make a lot of money. Most of my funding has come through academic grants. right? That's not monetizing it. That's saying that I'm doing something of quality, which people appreciate. Give me some grant money to do another season of it. right? Um, that's sort of how academics do things. Um, and I'm in four, in four seasons. I don't know how long, much longer that's going to last. Yeah. Um, we, ha we have another question. Are there any good examples of cross-disciplinary podcasts? Oh, too many. Um, <laughs> I, gosh. Um, I, I'm afraid that my answers are going to be pretty boring in that <laughs> I don't listen. I don't have too many um, things that are on my podcast list that are indie produced that are new that nobody else has heard about. Right? Mm -hmm. Most of the good big production houses that do anything um, that's academic adjacent, they're all very interdisciplinary and cross mm -hmm. Even Freakonomics Radio doesn't just talk to economists, mm -hmm. right? Um, Invisibilia does just does, doesn't just stay with um, psychologists, and neither does Radio Lab. Uh, I would say that um, if you're going to do anything good, it's got to be cross disciplinary in some way. If I do a whole season on criminal justice and I only talk to philosophers, that's a horrible show, right? You're not learning from criminologists who have done experimentation, experimental studies on efficacy of sentencing and recidivism and things like that. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and you know what, when we talk about professional development, just sort of in general, um, you know, we, we focus a lot on interdisciplinary teams, you know, weaving in, you know, multiple disciplines into, you know, problem solving. And, you know, when, when we think about this, it is really sort of big 
picture framing um, for uh, the ways that we envision professional development for our PhD students, really um, working across departments, across disciplines, learn, you know, I think the way you wove your your podcast together, um, you know, really is an illustration of that. You had to talk to lawyers and uh, you had to talk to, you know, so many different um, specialists in their areas and understand those intersections uh, with philosophy and where, how you would bring that story together. Um, so we do have one one final question, I think, right? We're about at one one ten. I think we probably have time for one more question. Were there were there any other um, slides, uh, Barry, in your your presentation? We're good. Okay, just wanted to double check on that. Um, so it says uh, this this question is, I think, pretty large. So hopefully they can put it all up on the screen. So I'll read it from the ch chat. Looks like you have a great setup. Would you recommend that a graduate student try to buy or learn the tech or partner with someone who already knows the tech? Are there any organizations that support up and coming podcasters? The tech is trivial to learn. It's not something that should be intimidating to anybody. Anybody who today downloads a piece of digital audio uh, workstation, digital audio station, if you have a Mac, you have GarageBand already. You'll be able to cut something and make something uh, by the end of the day. Um, are there organizations? Yes, Transom. T-R-A-N-S-O-M, transom.org is a great organization that supports um, podcasters. They have essentially dissertations worth of things about scoring, about tracking, which is reading. How do you read something to set up data? There's a there you can find just about everything there. There are podcasts about making podcasts. Um, transom has a good one called How Sound. So plenty of support. Yeah, absolutely. And we know that uh, our next session is a podcasting 101 panel uh, that will feature uh, lots of advice as well for for students uh, to to really think about how they can work uh, with many of the different departments and centers across campus that are also offering support for budding podcasters. Um, so how do you approach people outside of your subject area to interview, especially when you're just starting out? That's a that's a new question coming in from Holden Lee, a PhD alum. Good, Holden. Uh, it is probably the biggest benefit and the most fulfillment I've had in doing the show that I get to approach people outside of my subject area and talk to them about their work, something that I would have not probably never done um, because I don't go to those conferences. Uh, what do I do? I download their work. I read it. I have some questions. I contact them and said, hey, I have this show called Hi-Fi Nation. Here's a link to it. I'd like to talk to you about this paper you wrote about this, this book you wrote read about that. I'm thinking about making an episode about it. Some of them might say no. Almost all of them say yes. And then you schedule an interview. And the way that you prepare is that you read their work very carefully and you ask them questions about it. Um, most of those questions are very simple questions. Most of those questions are questions like, uh, tell me about this one section. Like, how would you explain that? And so on. But some of them are going to be more critical questions because you are a PhD. You're going to have an advanced level understanding of something. And you're probably going to you know, go with where your curiosity takes you. And let's think about your professors. They're just probably professors uh, also. And they're going to be you know, used to talking about their work. Yeah. Yeah, that I, I think your advice earlier about sort of letting your curiosity guide you and, and also, you know, at the end of the day, you know, being having an interest and a curiosity around the human experience, right? And so as you connect with people in a really authentic way and ask questions to them um, that, that show evidence that you've done your homework, that you've researched um, and you understand, um, but you have more questions to ask them, right? That That's uh, something we, we all appreciate. Um, that's also, you know, as I think of professional development and framing, you know, when you're interviewing, when you're uh, reaching out to connect with other individuals, really understanding, knowing a little bit about them and what their passions are and what they're really interested in helps you to forge that connection. 
Um, so that'll be helpful in podcasting. That'll certainly be helpful in, in professional development in general. Um, so we have one, I think we have one last question uh, from uh, Rohit G, a Woodrow Wilson, uh, looks like Woodrow Wilson School student, asks via email, how do you promote your podcasts? In the beginning, use the networks that you have. What networks do you have? I don't know. Your undergraduate institution, your graduate institution, right? If you're a faculty like I am, I use Vassar too. I use all of those institutions. Are there philosophy blogs? Yes, there are. Let them know about it. Right? <laughs> you know. So in the beginning, just use whatever you have. Uh, after a while, then you might have to be a little bit more creative about it. You know, uh, what journalists have reviewed podcasts? What journalists are interested in philosophy? Um, can you contact them? You know. Uh, so there's no secret to it. If uh, I said there are a lot of, you know podcasts, uh, how to do this, how to do that out there. There's stuff out there, how to promote it. You know, some of that stuff will work, some of that won't work, but there's no, there's no real secret. You're just trying to get it in front of as many people. So who can help you do that? Yeah. So one final question, looking back now, what would you tell your PhD student self about what you're doing today? What would I tell my PhD student self? Yeah, so looking back when you were a student, what would you tell your yourself now? Huh, I would say that, oh my gosh, um, <laughs> you are doing something you never thought you would be doing in graduate school you are happy doing it and it works out. <laughs> um, in graduate school, I was very myopically focused on what a dissertation, um, how, how can I um, finish my dissertation? What, it's going, what, what is it going to be about? And um, I just, <laughs> um, I didn't know that there would be an area of audio I probably would have told myself to start sooner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, but it all works out. I think that's what I would say. Absolutely. And I, I think that is a perfect closing <laughs> uh, for uh, your our session today. Thank you so much. For, this has just been such an informative session. And really, as we're thinking about um, telling stories, podcasting is really something that students are very, very interested in, but sometimes a little apprehensive about and where do I start? And so you really help to guide us through um, the sort of inner workings of how you get started, what, what that looks like, um, the storytelling aspect and, and doing some, you know, really your homework and the interviews that were involved. Um, I think that was really illuminating for all of us um, to see, you know, the transcripts essentially of all of those interviews and how much uh, time uh, has gone in. I We're going to uh, share out some more information, of course, you know, about podcasting in our in our next session. And I know, Barry, you're, you're going to be part of that panel as well. Yes, yeah, I will be sticking around for the panel. Well, we really appreciate it. We can't thank you so much for taking time. And, and again, you know, the, the intention of the Grad Futures Forum is really to connect uh, our current pre PhD students with alums uh, who are out there, who are a network of support. Um, Barry, I know you, you work with students at Vassar. You give workshops and, and seminars on podcasting. Um, and and so can can students reach out to you? Um, how could they they reach out to you if they have questions? That might be another uh, you know, question. Find, if, uh, I'm at highfination at gmail.com. You can go to highfination.org just to, to email me there. I'm, I'm easy to find and I respond to everything. Well, we, we thank you so much for taking the time and sharing so much of your journey and in podcasting with us. And we look forward to more advice in the, the Podcasting 101 session. Thank you so much. We're going to take a, a quick 
uh, break uh, for, for just a few minutes while we assemble our, our panelists. Um, please do keep your questions coming in at the hashtag gradfuturesforum. Uh, we'll be looking for those uh, on Twitter. We'll also be looking at our email address, which is gradfutures at princeton.edu. Um, and so we, we thank you so much. Um, we're going to keep the, the video going. Uh, we're going to really say stick where you are. You don't need to leave. We, we, we're just going to leave this up um, and ro roll right into our podcasting panel. So we're just going to take a brief hiatus, but you don't need to leave. We're going to keep the video going. Thank you. Um, we're, hopefully we can roll out with a podcast from Barry. From if you want to start a career in crime, the best person to earn the operator of the Crime a Day Twitter account. So I wrote a book called How to Become a Federal Criminal, an illustrated handbook for the aspiring offender. It's a federal crime to make an unreasonable gesture to a passing horse in a national park. That's all the law says. And so does the horse have to find them unreasonable? What kind of gestures does a horse find unreasonable? Go through some gestures that might be unreasonable towards a horse. Can you describe some of these gestures? Well, there's the, the classic, the middle finger, but you want to have a strong middle like finger. Like two middle fingers, maybe the double crime. I, I think that that's clearly going to be evidence of intent, right? And yeah. so it makes the prosecutor's case a heck of a lot easier. I think it's also a little bit controversial whether the middle finger with the other fingers bent oh, sure. or like curved down is worse. Yeah, yeah, also, yeah. Right? A tight fist with the middle finger versus a little bit of bend. I, I know. Yeah. I mean, but that that's where you can add a little bit of personal flair, right, okay. to each each gesture. I, I go into the moon. Yeah, like a little bit of crack might just... No, all crack. The all whole crack. crack. The oh, whole you don't crack. want a little bit of crack. Okay. A little bit of crack could totally be a... You, you're going to get acquitted. You're going to get acquitted. Okay. But not but, quite uh, offensive enough. Yeah. Right? No. It if you got the accident. Right. Crack all the way down to the bottom and you're definitely going to get arrested. And then I personally like the bras de honor, the arm of honor, I believe it's called. It's where yeah. you sort of like slap your hand palm down onto your bicep and you hook your other arm in an L shape upwards and it sort of tells everybody up yours like yeah. hey up yours that's right yeah. yeah there's also these like ethnic ones too oh yeah like like if the horse might be italian or something sure the right. chin flick so you sort of like take the back of your fingers with your hand <laughs> and you hold it under your chin and you just kind of aggressively move it outward from underneath your chin unfortunately the kind of crimes mike chase wants to teach you about aren't the ones that'll pay off if anything, they might actually cost you. But if you wanted a career breaking as many criminal laws as possible without hurting anyone, you should definitely get his book. If you sell pork from a pig carcass that has a pronounced sexual odor, that's a crime. But if it's less than pronounced, it's okay. You just you can sell it for certain purposes. It can be comminuted, you know, chopped up. It can be put into certain kinds of pork products. And so, yeah, it leaves some question. When is a sexual odor pronounced and when is it less than pronounced? What is a sexual odor? And it's not defined in the regulation. Uh, there's a lot of margarine-based crimes. Uh, ma margarine is a great example because it, it shows how we ended up with a lot of the statutory federal crimes, which is that they're the product of lobbying efforts. So butter was king. And then margarine was the new kid on the block. And the dairy lobby was furious. And so they went to Congress and they said, we need to ban it. If you are a restaurateur and you're serving individual pats of margarine, they have to be triangular in shape. And you say, well, that's silly and, and inane. But there's a guy, Joseph Trawaski, here in Hartford, Connecticut. He got charged for it twice and got hauled out of his restaurant for serving square pats of margarine. <laughs> Besides all the food-based crimes, there are also postal service crimes. Apparently, it's really serious to dress in a postal uniform when you're not a postal worker. And there are a surprisingly large number of crimes having to do with the sanctity of our national parks. Where is clogging a toilet a federal crime? National forest. 
Yeah. Any national forest. They are, I guess, federal toilets, right, on national forest land. And it's a federal crime to put any substance in a toilet that could interfere with its use and clog it. The term is substance. Substance. Yeah, substance. And it wasn't always substance. There was a time when they said rags, cans, objects, things like that. The purpose there clearly was, are you putting an object in with the intent to clog a toilet, right? That's what we would think would make sense. But there have been revisions to the rule, and in fact, additions to the rule, that now make it clear that any substance put in a toilet to interfere with its use, without regard for intent, that becomes a federal crime. And so it's pretty vague. Even an accidental toilet clogging is totally permissible as a federal crime. From Slate, this is Hi Fi Nation, philosophy in story form. This season, crime and punishment. Recording from Vassar College, here's your host, Barry Lamb. Welcome to Hi-Fi Nation, Season 4. Lots of things are happening this season, so let me tell you about them up front before we continue. Each episode of this series looks at a certain stage of the criminal justice system, takes a practice that happens in that stage, and uncovers its underlying assumptions, questioning them, see if they contribute to justice or injustice. And today it's about the first stage, legislation. When a bunch of people we elect get together and try to formulate what's a crime and who goes to jail. This season, we're going to look at every stage, policing, prosecution, sentencing, what it's like in jails, and what happens after you get to leave. There's going to be an exclusive bonus episode following every episode this season with long-form discussions of the issues. It'll feature me and a special guest. For the first four episodes, it'll be Sarah Lusbader, public defender and writer at The Appeal. And if you, like me, uh, leave law school and then become a public defender, it all kind of breaks down. The first bonus episode will be free, but all subsequent ones will be available with a Slate Plus membership. I'm also doing invite-only Zoom events after every episode, where I and a special guest will get to meet you. To find out how to get an invitation, go to hifination.org. Let's get back to the episode. Mike Chase has been trying to organize and catalog the federal criminal code for six years now. It's something no lawmaker, nonprofit, or government agency has been able to do. And if I can be frank, Mike probably won't succeed in doing this in his lifetime. It's like taking a census of the New York roach population. There's a list of crimes that arise the way we would expect. Someone or group lobbies the federal government. Congress passes a law, it gets signed, and it's a statutory criminal law. But then there are all these criminal laws that arise from regulatory agencies. The FDA wants to protect us from sexually smelly pork, so they notify pork producers of the new rule. At the same time, Congress will pass this other law that says that regulations coming out of the FDA or the Department of the Interior, or the U.S. Postal Service, shall also be criminal laws. As a result, then, you get hundreds of thousands of regulations that are automatically criminalized, subjecting its violators to arrest, prosecution, or jail time. It's part of a distinctive American phenomena called governing through crime. Governing through crime is a phrase from Jonathan Simon, a criminologist and law professor at at Berkeley. This is Benjamin Levin, law professor at the University of Colorado, Boulder. And the idea of governing through crime is that the way the government responds, the way legislators respond to each new social problem, each time we have kind of a terrible thing that happens in the world and someone says, we need to do something about this, the way of doing something about this is passing a new criminal statute. According to Ben Levin, governing through crime is not a left-right issue, not a Democrat-Republican issue. It's more of a governing by stick versus by carrot issue. Every political party, every ideological orientation, seems to have a preferred set of bad guys they want governed by sticks. The schools are pretty bad. 
Too many behavior problems. How about a few more cops, random locker searches, and juvenile arrests? There have been a rash of hoodlums causing horses to buck their riders off. Let's give park rangers the authority to arrest and charge them. One particularly powerful tool in governing through crime is to formulate a law that makes it a crime to do something rather than purposefully do something. That's an important difference. One makes the act illegal in all situations. The other only makes illegal the act done with a certain motive. Most of these federal crimes say nothing about motive. They don't say anything about knowledge either. You can't plead ignorance, for instance, if you decide to flush your stash of Vicodin down a national forest toilet and clog it up, leading to your arrest. The toilet clogging law is a no intent, no knowledge required criminal law, which means that accidents are no excuse and ignorance is no excuse. us for the Grad Futures Forum, hosted by Princeton University's Graduate School. The main goal of the forum is to expose graduate students to a diversity of professional paths to provide them with practical information and tangible next steps, and to connect them with the amazing network of support they have available to them throughout the broader Princeton community. Thank you to those who tuned in for Princeton PhD alumnus Barry Lamb's session on his Hi-Fi Nation podcast. Thank you for joining us again for our Podcasting 101 panel. I'd like to welcome our panel moderator, Wright Sinieris. Wright is the social media and marketing specialist for the Princeton Entrepreneur Council and host of the Spark podcast featuring stories of, that make up the Princeton University entrepreneurial and innovation ecosystem. And those who have been taking risks to bring transformational ideas and companies to the world in the nation's service and in the service of humanity. Wright will join us and introduce his panelists. Thank you, Eva. And thank you to our friends at uh, Grad Futures and the Graduate School for putting this great forum on over the last two, three days. And um, it's a really a testament to what collaboration can do and uh, what makes Princeton great is the collaboration. Um, and thank you. Uh, I must thank Rod Priestley, the uh, Vice Dean of Innovation at Princeton, for shouting out the Princeton Spark podcast yesterday. Uh, that was great to hear. So thank you, Rod. Uh, and thank you, Barry, uh, for the great presentation we just saw and just listened to. I love behind the scenes stuff, whether it's podcasting or rock bands or, or anything like that. So it was great to see how your process works. And I've taken a few notes for my own uh, edification. So thank you, Barry. Uh, I'd like to thank our panelists for their assistance and participation in this uh, panel. Uh, most of them helped me get the Princeton Spark started. So I'm thrilled to pay it forward in this uh, panel for everyone today. Um, as I've said, I'm the social media and marketing specialist at the Princeton Entrepreneurship Council. I'm also the host and producer of the Princeton Spark podcast. And um, I was uh, very honored to be asked to moderate this uh, because uh, podcasting to me is so much fun and uh, it makes something uh, on top of my regular job uh, even more fun. Uh, and it's fun to talk about what it takes to succeed in entrepreneurship and speaking to Princeton people about that and um, providing a service in a way to humanity in that, in that way. So I will get started to introduce the panelists. Uh, I will call on them to uh, take a minute to uh, tell us who you are and what you do at Princeton. And uh, I'll start with uh, Barry. And since he was just uh, speaking, I'll have him introduce himself again. I'm Barry Lamb. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. All right. I'm Barry Lamb. Uh, I'm an associate professor of philosophy at Vassar College. I'm Princeton graduate, PhD, uh, 2007. And I also <clears throat> produce and host the Hi-Fi Nation podcast on Slate. Great. Thank you, Barry. Uh, Rose is next on our list here. Uh, please introduce yourself. Thanks, Ray. I'm Rose Huber. I'm the communications manager and senior writer at the Woodrow Wilson School. I produce Politics and Polls, which is a weekly news show um, co-hosted by Julian Zelzar and Sam Wong, two Princeton professors. 
And I also host EndNotes, which is a um, series featuring our faculty books. Great. Next up, Margaret Koval. Please sign in and introduce yourself. Hi there, I, I'm Margaret Koval. I'm the Director of Special Projects in the Office of Communications. I'm also a graduate alum from uh, 1985. Um, I'm producing a current podcast called We Roar, and I'm the host and producer of a, of a limited series that has since ended called She Roars, uh, and um, working on starting up other podcasts uh, on behalf of the university here. Super. Okay, next we'll have Oleg introduce himself. Hi, everyone. My name is Oleg Navarovsky. I'm a fifth year graduate student and um, I'm in the civil engineering department. So podcasting isn't really uh, what we're known for. And I'm doing a podcast with the Keller Center for Entrepreneurship uh, with Derek Lido there. And we're exploring uh, issues about ethics and entrepreneurship at large. Great. Uh, next, we have David Hopkins. Please introduce yourself. Hello, my name is David Hopkins, uh, Senior Manager of the Video Production Support slash Broadcast Center, um, and been at the university for over 25 years. Um, and so it's been great to see the amazing technologies that have happened on campus and how we are able to have uh, uh, great tools and technologies that we uh, can make available for these wonderful type of uh, productions here on campus. Great, and our last but not least, Panelist here, uh, Tiger, please uh, introduce yourself. Let's bring him on screen. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Tiger. I'm a third year undergrad, a junior uh, in Princeton studying economics. Uh, I host a show called Policy Punchline, uh, which is available across all the platforms. And we basically interview guests, have long form conversations that last usually an hour per episode. And we update uh, one to two episodes per week. Uh, usually it's just guest speakers who come on campus who happen to have a guest lecture on economics or policy or tech or any subject matter. And we try to grab them after their guest lecture and then uh, have a dialogue with them about whatever they do. And I was very much inspired uh, by Rose and politics and polls. And she actually got me started with all this stuff. So I, I am the most uh, junior person here with, with uh, <laughs> in terms of experience. Yeah. Thank you, Tiger. Uh, so since this is a podcasting 101 panel discussion, I'd like to start by asking why. I think that's the great organizing principle of this uh, this panel. So uh, the question that I had for the panel, and I'll start with Barry, um, why do a podcast? And especially Barry, since you were a, a PhD alum of Princeton, um, for someone who's in grad school now, they might be thinking, I'm busy enough. So why do a podcast? Isn't grad school making you busy enough? If you're asking yourself that question, then you probably shouldn't do a podcast because you are busy. Most mm -hmm. of the people who want to do a podcast just really want to do it. <laughs> and if you really want to do it, you should go ahead and do it. The reason why is because you can. We are, you have, we're in an era where you don't need a program director of some radio station to audition you or go through internships to be able to talk to people and put it out there. Now, doesn't mean everybody's going to listen and um, or anyone really, but um, it, it means that they could be. You know, it's kind of like asking, should I start a blog, you know, 15 years ago or something <laughs> yes. like that, right? Or should I start a zine or something like that? Right. Um, if you have something you want to say, something you want to put out there. Um, right now, there's you know, there's just no better time to do it. You have access to all of the technology. You have it in your laptop. And it's, you know, dirt cheap to actually put it up and host it somewhere. You know, the, the labor really comes in trying to get people to listen. But if you have something to say, you should do, you should do it. I really know what you mean about um, not having the time but doing it because you want to. And my, at least in my case, I didn't really have time and I knew I didn't have time. But then when an alum asked that, hey, you guys should have a podcast, then it was nothing, I couldn't think about anything else. Like I had to have this podcast. So um, I feel that uh, very strongly. Um, I'd like to go to Oleg since he's a current grad student and ask him um, you know, why did he decide to do a podcast with Derek uh, with the situation that he's in in, in civil engineering? And... 
All right, so we lost Oleg. Uh, we'll bring him back in, but um, we'll uh, pivot and while we're getting uh, him back in and um, say that um, since this is an academic audience, the next question I'll get into, and we'll, we'll bring Oleg in to, to talk about his uh, why answer, but I'd like to talk to uh, Barry and Tiger and then Oleg again about uh, how does having a podcast help your academic work? Oh, here's Tiger. So Tiger, uh, <laughs> you hear the last question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, how, how does podcasting help with my academic work? Yes. Uh, so I, I guess the way Policy Punchline works that even though we have the word policy in our title, we actually interview guests from all kinds of subject matters, from economics to finance, from tech uh, to politics. And so uh, I, I think uh, the way it has impacted me and my team is that we do very in-depth research on all of those guests' work. Uh, so, for example, uh, this afternoon, I'm interviewing this uh, guest called Bruce Schneier. Uh, he's like a public uh, interest technologist. He wrote this very interesting book about uh, Internet security and all that stuff. So I actually read the book and, and get myself prepared. So that's usually how we try to conduct our research before each interview. We just we don't just write some random questions to go in, but we actually do hours and hours of, of research. We have a research team of around 20 students. Uh, each person has some different interests. So. Uh, we spend so much so much time on actually trying to understand the subject matter and uh, ask very sensible and in-depth questions and actually have those dialogues with those guests. So I think uh, it, it, it's first and foremost a wonderful learning experience for us students. Uh, none of us really got into this because we could get uh, money or, or advertisement or because we can't. I mean, it, it's not like we get hundreds of thousands of listening. So uh, I think that's the, the biggest impact for me, per se. Great. So uh, let me stick with you. Uh, Answer the question: What? Why do a podcast? Um, what was it that thought in your mind uh, that a podcast would be a way to um, augment your experience at Princeton? Uh, I, I, it's very interesting because uh, uh, Barry was just saying how, like, uh, you know, it, it, everybody's already, you know, so busy, and you really have to have a passion for having conversations with people and really wanting to do it. And uh, the, the thing that sparked me is because so many guests come to Princeton every week and every day to give guest lectures, uh, but very rarely they are actually interviewed by either the campus newspaper or other media. And podcasting is very unique in the sense that you can have those long form dialogues that last an hour or two hours or, or however long you wish it to be. Uh, and, and the medium is, is not constrained. So uh, you could con the, the amount of knowledge and material that you can convey within an hour through audio is so much more uh, than one article that you can write on a school newspaper. Uh, so this medium combined with uh, the fact that so many interesting voices come on campus uh, really made me think, why shouldn't I start a podcast that bring on other co-hosts, other students to ask uh, those wonderful guests uh, interesting questions and hear their thoughts on, on those issues. So that's kind of what uh, inspired me and kept me up uh, until today. That's fantastic. Uh, let me go back to you, Barry. Um, since you're a practicing academic, um, and you've touched on this in, your, in the panel previously, but uh, if you could reiterate uh, how having Hi-Fi Nation has helped you in your academic work. It's made me branch out, uh, think about and write about topics that were outside of my um, area of specialization. And if you are a PhD, your specialization is probably narrower and narrower. Uh, so it allows you to talk to people who um, at a level that you wouldn't otherwise be talking to outside of your field, criminologists, uh, you know, statisticians, you know, I'm in philosophy. I don't usually get to have inter interactions with them. Makes you a better writer and communicator Academic writing is its own um, has its own norms of, of of expression that are unique to about twenty other people who know what you know <laughs> and research what you research. Um, but if you are trying to explain and present to people that are not experts uh, and trying to keep holding their attention, that has a very positive effect on the way that you write, think, and speak. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. We've got Oleg back. So, uh, Oleg, we were talking about um, how does having a podcast help you in academic work? So, uh, talk to us about what uh, your your situation is 
working in the Keller Center, but in the civil engineering department. Uh, so what you sure. say about that? So I think it's a great opportunity to do something different uh, during your five years at Princeton and graduate school. I have a newspaper clipping from Freeman Dyson uh, when he came to visit campus a few years ago. Uh, so I have, a, I have this newspaper clipping on my desk back at back on campus, and I don't know if it's still there, but it basically says the PhD system is thoroughly bad for the health. And I always keep that in mind because um, it's important to keep some distance in between your work all the time, and you can't just focus on research 24-7. So I think this podcasting opportunity was a really good way for me to just try something new, try something different. And if you don't do that, if you don't go out and like find new things to do and new things to try, then I don't think you're getting like as much as you can out of your graduate school experience. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, you mentioned it in your intro, but you had, uh, so you're in the civil engineering department, but you're doing your fellowship and doing a podcast with Derek Lido in the Keller Center for Innovation and Engineering Education. Um, where did you get the idea for that? Um, that which is, it seems to be separate from your academic work, but um, I'm always interested in the genesis of ideas. So sure. where, where did this come from? So personally, I'm very interested in entrepreneurship and kind of the whole business world. And it's kind of an aside to my current career and you know, as a graduate student. Um, so the podcast project that I'm working on basically came out of the university's university administrative fellows program. Uh, and that's what James Van Wick here is uh, doing. So basically, I was asked if I wanted to work with Derek on a project to um, make people in the general public more aware of the ethical issues surrounding entrepreneurship. Okay. And at that time, there was no, there's no talk of a podcast, but we kind of um, pitched that as a, an idea and it was, um, Derek liked it and I'm already, you know, we're working on our third episode right now, so. So Margaret, I could talk to you about the why question, um, please. Uh, Let's hear. Yeah, I mean, I have a slightly different perspective because I, I, I left graduate school quite a long while ago and went into journalism, went into broadcast journalism. And so suddenly found myself on the other side of, of, of that great divide, you know, the world of communications and the world of academia. And I found myself really frustrated at the time with what was kind of a, an ivory tower uh, approach where the, you know, the great thinking that went on inside academia and I was studying politics um, stayed there. I think that's changed a lot just as a matter of course, but I think it's obvious now that it has to change, that mm -hmm. academian, academicians, scholars need to get their words out, need to get their thoughts out. So podcasting is a great way, a great unmediated way of taking the knowledge that you have and giving it to people. I, think, I view it as a, as a public service as well. And something that I think academics have to get good at doing is communicating better. And, and, and a lot of the problems that we're seeing in public policy now is that academics haven't always, and experts haven't always communicated well to the right. general public. Right, there's, uh, and Barry talked about this in his panel, the, the engineering versus architecture um, disconnect. And I think yeah. uh, you really touched on that. Um, it's great, uh, unless uh, anyone else has anything to chime in on that. Um, I'd like to talk more about the actual nuts and bolts of uh, the podcasting process. So um, let's go to Rose. Uh, when you start the podcasts, uh, how do you decide who your audience is? That's a good question. I will piggyback off what Margaret said, which is that at the Woodrow Wilson School, our end goal is always to get research to policymakers. And we can do that in a number of ways. We can reach out to policymakers directly, or we can do it through the media. Um, we write research briefs where we distribute sort of press releases to them, but we thought that this podcast could be another mechanism to reach those audiences. Um, we build our shows with a variety of voices in mind. So we bring on academics, we bring on policymakers, we bring on those from the media, 
all in the effort to spread that message far and wide. Um, I will say, just to answer the why question, I come at this from a creative writing background and I have my MFA. And I remember in school being taught that the words should dictate the form. So when you're looking at what you want to express, whatever research piece that is, um, is podcasting the right method? It really depends on the personality types, um, the conversational skills. Uh, maybe that really isn't the right way to spread your message. So just remember to think about what form your words or work should take on. Super, super. Um, Maybe I can add one yeah, more. Please, please do. Sure. Yes. So uh, I was trying. I was explaining how you know. So I was meeting with my mentor Derek Lido at the Color Center, and we were thinking about how do we educate the public at large about ethics and entrepreneurship. And you know, we talked a lot of, about different ideas, about a website, about um, a video series, and I really pitched the idea of a podcast because. I made the point that, hey, look, everybody is spending so much time, you know, with their headphones in, walking around, driving, going to the gym. And you just have to take advantage of the fact that people have so much of this downtime to listen to stuff. They're not going to be always uh, able to watch a screen or, uh, you know, go on a big website. And this kind of long form media is really, really um, ubiquitous nowadays. And it's it's a great way of just accessing a larger audience. and if you have something to say, your audience, whoever that may be, will find you if you, you know, go through the the right advertising and spreading mm -hmm. of your message. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a that's something that resonates with me because I consider podcasting the best way to make dishwashing fun. Okay, <laughs> so um, I even use this in my advertisements. Like you can make you can do this while you're doing the dishes. Uh, so. Um, we've got a question from an alum. Uh, can we put that on the screen, Neil? Great. So the question from the alum, AM, says, is how do you measure the value of a podcast on an organization? And what makes it valuable enough to take the considerable time and energy? So let's start with uh, Margaret on this one. Um, you know, you're, uh, <laughs> you're tasked very, uh, very, uh, distinctly with these kinds of questions. So what do you say? Yeah. Is? I mean, these are hard questions um, uh, because, you know, we obviously, when we're making podcasts for Princeton University, uh, we don't have any kind of, um, uh, you know, market criteria. We're not looking to make money. We're looking to, in general, uh, spread information about the research that we do and the value of higher education. So the return on investment is is measured in 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 I suppose numbers of people who listen and in terms of engagement, but also, you know, who's listening. So um, and those things are very hard to pin down in the early stages. So I, I guess um, uh, um, I guess I would have to honestly say we're not measuring right now. We're 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 keeping track of metrics, obviously, but we're we're not looking at those as a measurement as to whether it's worth doing or not. Mm -hmm. We're actually doing that more anecdotally by mm -hmm. by whether people are getting good information and, and responding mm -hmm. positively. Mm -hmm. um, Barry, since uh, High Fi Nation's a Slate podcast, um, have the conversations uh, as far as advertising and metrics, um, what, what, what kind of relationship has what kind of situation has it come about for that? Oh, okay, that's a that's a good question. There are many different relationships that independently produced shows can have with a network. I one of my goals was to get on a network early on. I didn't want it to be eternally uh, an independent show. Uh, monetization was one of the issues. It really wasn't that big of an issue. It was really about marketing and promotion. I want to get people to listen to it. And a network is the best way to do that because a network has a lot of shows that has listeners. Sure. And if they can put this show in front of their other listeners, maybe other listeners will want to listen to it. That's the primary benefit, I think. There, they do, Slate does um, try to monetize it um, in, in that they have a sales team that sells ads for their other shows. The relationship that I have with Slate is that we share that. Um, some some of the shows at Slate, in fact, most of the other shows at Slate, are produced in-house in that they pay producers and hosts 
um, to make a show and then they try to recoup that money and make a profit on it through advertising. That's not the relationship that I have with them. I mm-hmm. still own the show. I still make the show. Okay. And they provide some editorial assistance. They listen to it. They give me notes. Um, and that's very helpful to have okay. people help you do that. And they do sell ads when they can. Um, and if they if they can't do it, as with COVID-19, I like a lot of media are struggling, um, I'm still putting the show out. You know, my show doesn't rely on revenue to be made. Um, it relies on my work and my labor to be made. Great. Um, we have a question from the audience. Uh, if Neil could put the question on um, resources at the moment. So I'll ask it as Neil puts the question on the screen. Uh, David, I'd like to come to you. Um, the question is, uh, I'm really interested in hearing about one gets started technically on a podcast. Do we have those capabilities available to all at Princeton or have these individuals sought out their own avenues? So um, we could tackle the resources available at Princeton question, because this is the thing that I asked you way back when, when I was getting started. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. So we uh, have a studio that's uh, in the Lewis uh, Lewis Science Library, and it's uh, been uh, it originally started as being a place where uh, professors were were being inter- uh, interviewed on television and on radio, and that also became the same place that we could also do uh, delivery of podcasts in that same space um, and using this using the same equipment, um, and so the other piece that that comes out of this too is, and when you talk about uh, the the options of doing uh, what we call vodcast and podcast video uh, mm-hmm. that's being done for it too. So we've had some cases where we've done recordings in the studio and have turned into podcasts. We've done cases where uh, podcasts were recorded in in the audio studio and then taken into the video studio uh, to be used in in a dual format. So mm-hmm. yes, the that's that's one of the biggest things is letting everyone know that the studio exists. Um, that we have full-time staff there to support and make sure that a quality uh, recording is done in the space uh, with high quality microphones that we have in place in there to do that work um, and then be able to th- do the post-production of that work and get it out for delivery to the to the world. Mm-hmm. I will say uh, I get compliments on how I sound on, 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 on the podcast and it's all due to the uh, staff <laughs> at the broadcast center. It's not me. It's, it's the it's the magic of the project. project. We enjoy doing it. But if, <laughs> if I, I know that one of the big questions was if you were in a mobile situation um, or wanted to do something at home of a setup for it. Um, Roadcaster is a quite impressive product. Um, then it's, they even do a whole packages with it that include the microphones and the recording system with it. Mm-hmm. And you can connect that system right up to uh, Adobe Audition um, and have that do your capture and your multi-track uh, recording into it, mm-hmm. let alone you can do your multi-track recording just on the Roadcaster itself. So that's a, mm-hmm. a great unit. Mm-hmm. And by the way, I will uh, we will have a uh, resource document with the things we talk about here uh, available at the Grad Future site. Uh, James and I will get that together and then it will be available for uh, anyone who's watching this. Uh, so we'll put the broadcaster on there. Let me sure to put that down. Broadcaster. Okay. Um, so I'd like to uh, take the next question here. So what is the best equipment to use for podcasting? Any mic recommendations? Uh, let's start with you, Dave. Uh, what, what do you say about that? Um, Heil, H-E-I-L, makes an excellent microphone uh, that it, it's, it's interesting. It becomes like this best kept secret um, because Sure has been out uh, forever and, of course, Neumann. Um, and uh, they make excellent mics too, but then the price point um, can be a challenge for when uh, people are thinking about uh, you know how much money they want to invest in creating a, creating their podcast. Sure. Uh, and so uh, if you look at the price point of, of a Heil, it's it's a great mic, um, does a really great sound on it, um, mm-hmm. and does really well in, in giving a full range of, mm-hmm. uh, of voices for delivery. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd like to pivot here to Tiger. Um, I'll bring Tiger back on the screen here. Uh, since he produces his podcast uh, quite frequently, <laughs> but a lot of episodes, sir. Uh, so can you just talk about your rig for a minute here? Um, what are you using? Sure. Uh, when we're on campus, we uh, do a lot of the episodes with the broadcast center. But since we are, uh, uh, you know, fully remote right now, sorry, right. I'm, a little, I'm next to a hospital, so it's uh, it could be a little bit noise in the background. My bad. 
Uh, I use this software called Squadcast. Uh, squad okay. like your squad, and then cast like uh, C A S T. Uh, okay. the, I, I think it's so far the best software I've, I've tried. Uh, I've tried that one. There's also another called Zencaster. Uh, those are all for remote recording. Um, so so it, it's usually 20, 30 bucks a month with a subscription. And uh, what I do is I still have my, it's usually not this noisy. I'm really sorry. It's just, of course not. <laughs> everything gets, gets uh, in your way when you start talking. You know? uh, so I, I have my usual mic when it comes to, it's just a lavalier mic that I bought. Um, kind of the, the same price point as what Mr. Hopkins was kind of talking about. Uh, and then I have a USB recorder that um, connector that okay. connects the mic with uh, with the computer. So now we just basically use an online subscription software that connects me and the guest, the guest, uh, and then I'll do it with my with my recorder at home. So it, it actually okay. works pretty well. Yeah. Interesting. Sorry yeah. about the noise again. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, this is this is a, a panel about podcasting and incidental noise. Uh, it's a it's an issue. Um, so. I'd like anyone else to jump in if they have recommendations on uh, equipment. Um, any of you going run and gun? Uh, I see Barry's got a setup there. Uh, yeah, yeah. What I want to say, there's anybody who does a Google, they're going to get you know thousands of documents with recommendations. You'll be flooded with recommendations. What I want to say to people is the room that you record in it can actually is way more important than the microphone that you use. You could spend a thousand dollars and on a microphone and record in a boomy room and you're going to sound boomy, right? And so um, record in a room with a lot of, with not a lot of reverb and a lot of soft uh, surfaces. Mm -hmm. I've seen even the pros and if there's make a uh, blanket one quick thing if I could add. Yeah, please. Uh, it, it, it seems to me that it's almost inevitable that, um, uh, that, that you have to screw up at some point. I, I don't know, because we were, I have a funny example. Uh, so one, when the COVID-19 crisis just started, we had, we had to do all the remote recording. We tried this software called Zencaster. Uh, and then uh, the way Zencaster works is that it records all the audio of, of each guest uh, remotely on their own computer first, on their mm -hmm. own browser storage, and then they upload mm -hmm. it to the cloud. Uh, one time, one of the professors uh, accidentally closed the browser 46 minutes in, and the whole thing was gone. Uh, I, I, I was very sad, but also very happy that I, I wasn't the one that, that screwed up because he would have been very <laughs> mad at me. But we were able to actually retrieve it back. But uh, it, it, just, wow. it, it just seems inevitable that um, it will have to screw up at some point. So the, the best way to, I guess, figure it out is uh, one is to find a software that has something to do with cloud backup or something, which Squadcast allows you to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and then maybe another thing is basically ask your guest to uh, set up the phone on the on on as well and just record it on the great side idea. just as a, as a backup so uh more backup is always good great suggestion and i think uh i speak for everyone here when when i say that we've all lost some audio at some point especially good interviews i think i just think of the time i interviewed someone at a conference and she had some great stuff to say and i went to listen to it later and it was gone so it happens to everybody it happens to everybody um, so that was a great answer for that. Um, I'd like to uh, start with the starting question. So how do I get started? What's the first thing to do uh, when you start this podcast journey? Um, when I go to you, Rose, uh, how did you get started? Such a good question. I feel like I made all of the mistakes <laughs> because... I, I believe it was one of the first podcasts at Princeton when, when we started, it was 2016. And I don't have a background in this, so I sort of stumbled my way through it. So I'm happy to share some tips and tricks I learned along the way. Please. Um, I'll start by saying that I think you want to think about your brand, whether your brand is you or something else. Um, mm. I don't think we anticipated that we would do maybe multiple shows over time. And so uh, thankfully we chose a name, we call it WooCast, which is our podcast enterprise. Mm -hmm. So all of our podcasts funnel under that. Um, so thankfully we had that name to fall back on. So it wasn't just politics and polls, we could have offshoots. So I would think about your brand to start and think about the time commitment that this is gonna take. I mean, I know Tiger has a small army of people working for him and I do as well. I have a lot of help from assistants and editors 
um, to produce a weekly show. So think about how much time you could actually commit to it because regularity is especially important in the podcasting world. Um, if it's a weekly show that is, or a regular sort of show, a series um, and seasons are different, which Margaret and others can speak about more mm -hmm. uh, clearly than me. Um, but yeah, you wanna think about if you can commit to it and it might be good to have a co-host. I think that's what works so well with politics and polls is that Julian and Sam were on a panel together in 2016 about the election that year. And the interplay between the two of them was just super great. And we thought these two personalities could work really well together. Um, Julian being a historian, Sam being a neuroscientist, they both have different ways of approaching an episode. And so the interplay is really great. And it, it sort of takes the pressure off of one person doing all of it. And Sam mm -hmm. actually wanted me to mention that specifically today. <laughs> right on, Sam. Um, I'd like to uh, go to Margaret about the getting started question. Um, what advice do you have for our attendees about getting started? Well, I think I think the the um, the key thing really is to understand what it is you want to say um, and what your point of view is. I mean, there's so many different formats for a podcast, um, mm -hmm. and the ones that we've been doing do benefit from a, a, a real unique selling point, as it were, something that that we can say that nobody else can say to our audience, that nobody else can can quite grab. So understand what is special about you because there's a million people out there talking about politics or talking about, you know, whatever, you know, right. mm -hmm. genetics. Yes. Um, so I, I, I can't overstress that. And, and, and Rose just referred to the fact that we, we've um, begun to think harder about doing limited series podcasts. And uh, I think a lot about narrative arc um, mm -hmm. too. That's what's the narrative arc of the series going to be? You know, what's the first episode, the last episode? What's the journey you're going to take people on? And then mm -hmm. what's the narrative arc inside each episode that's going to end in a satisfying yet enticing way to get people to come back? So, you mm -hmm. know, as we talk about technology, I'd really hate to have those sorts of kind of storytelling uh, questions uh, get left on the table. Th those can right. be the most important. Right. That's, um, that's a great segue to the next question. Um, the question is, what do I need to make a good podcast? And I think the number one thing is to have something interesting to say. And um, since uh, Oleg, you have um, gone on this project that's not quite part of your academic work, um, what have you been finding as, uh, in your development as the, what's making a podcast good? Uh, good technically or good as in content wise? Good as in content wise. Yeah. So, so to reiterate, so my, our podcast, I'm working with another graduate student, Corey Isaacs, uh, in the Woodrow Wilson School. And our uh, general theme is what is a good entrepreneur? So, to answer that question, you really need to pick the right people to talk to, and you really need to get them talking and um, Basically, well, one thing that we've realized is that you don't really know what people are going to say, and you don't really know what your audience wants to hear. Mm -hmm. But I think the the best way to make a um, to answer a question like "What is a good entrepreneur?" In a, in, a, in a compelling way is to just get a lot of different perspectives from as a as a diverse uh, group of people as you can. So mm -hmm. we've just been asking people, "Hey, what is a good entrepreneur?" Without even actually asking them what we mean by good. Right. Um, and that results in us coming back into the studio with all these recordings of people saying completely different things. Mm -hmm. And then we kind of mash it together and uh, create this kind of, uh, you know, juxtapose different views together. And I think that kind of lets the narrative write itself. Mm -hmm. So for, for in my experience, um, quality comes from a diverse set of perspectives. And that if you can just uh, incorporate it into one show, you know, three or four different people disagreeing or agreeing um, mm -hmm. makes for a good listen. Mm -hmm. Barry, I'd like to turn to you about the good podcast content-wise question. And you talked about this a lot in your panel, but um, for this new audience, um, what, what goes into your thinking when you want to make a good podcast? I don't have a chat show, right? So I don't mm -hmm. have an interview show either. E even either. Mm -hmm. um, those are two mediums that I think depend a lot on uh, talent. <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I, I think they're, and personality. 
and and guests. Uh, I have a narrative show, which is essentially a kind of a documentary style. So what matters on shows like mine are how you stitch things together, mm -hmm. right? What the issue is, what the mm -hmm. story is, and how you stitch it all together into something compelling, mm -hmm. right? So what makes for a good document, I mean, this is true of all other mediums, right? What makes for a good documentary is not the same thing that makes a good talk show, right? right. Um, what makes a good uh, mm -hmm. interview show is very different. So mm -hmm. you have people have to think about what their own talents are, what their own skills are, and what it is that they want to develop. And to me, it, it, <laughs> to me, it wasn't, um, do you think I could be funnier and more attractive to people? Uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> I don't think that's true. Um, do, do you think that you can be this expert interviewer who can get somebody? Uh, I don't even know if I want to be that person. Mm -hmm. um, so what is it that I think that I wanted to develop? Well, I wanted to develop skills in stitching together um, stories and issues. Um, like Frontline or <laughs> This American Life or yes. something like that. And if you're going right. to make a show like that, then you're going to have to develop a whole different set of skills than you mm -hmm. are if you're just doing an interview show or if you're just mm -hmm. talking with a panel. Right, right. I, uh, I had that crossroads when I was developing the Princeton Spark. I thought um, I could just turn the mics on and let it rip. But the podcasts that I liked were podcasts like This American Life and 99% Invisible and Radio Lab, and so it's very narrative driven. And I thought, okay, well, that's more work, but I want to make the podcast that I want to listen to. So I had to develop this kind of uh, story arc structure. Um, one thing that I did when I got started was to take the uh, Creative Live course that Alex Bloomberg did on uh, from Gimlet and Spotify. He had something called uh, Power Your Podcast Through Storytelling. And so I saw a sale on Facebook. It was like 20 bucks. I thought, well, I love Alex Boomberg. Let me watch his thing. And the thing most I took out of that was you need to know the answer to uh, this line. The line was, uh, this is a story about X. And you have to fill in X. And you have to say, this is a story about X. And it's interesting because Y. So you need to solve for X and Y in this equation here. And so that really crystallized it for me. Think, okay, taking risks as an entrepreneur. Okay, that's why is that interesting? So I had to bring that out in the questions that I developed for my guests, um, the narrative pieces that I use to stitch together the pieces that I talk to multiple guests. And so um, answering that question in my head all the time, okay, why this is interesting because why? So um, at least for me, that was why, uh, how I try to make a good podcast. The people say that they that it's good, so I think it worked, but um, that's it for me. Uh, for a chat, sh for a, an interview show um, that's not narrative necessarily, um, Tiger, let me come to you for that question. Uh, would you mind just? Uh, sure, uh, the question is uh, how do I make a good podcast? So when you're interviewing these people after giving these lectures, um, what do you have in mind when you, you want to get the good stuff? Yeah, uh, our show is actually very, very different from, uh, like for example, Barry's Hi-Fi Nation. Like we were, uh, in comparison, very, very poorly produced. All we have is uh, intro music and end to music. <laughs> we just have one hour long um, edited uh, uh, conversation. I think I think probably the most important thing is the flow of the conversation. We usually try not to uh, disrupt that. We, we usually try to have um, some kind of uh, either banter going on or uh, rapport going on. Uh, so I think in the, the flow is, is, is quite important. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I do think a, a lot of people are bringing up the question these days of uh, do people actually have the patience of li listening through a one hour long podcast? And I think that's a val very valid one. Um, but, but you still have long form dialogues such as you know Joe Rogan's podcast that's literally like three hours long. Uh, mm -hmm. That's getting millions of views. So, so I, I don't think there isn't a market for long form dialogue. It's just you, you have to make sure uh, the questions do go deeper and deeper and that there is kind of a, a narrative or a logic inherently built into the dialogue and right. and that the, the and, and and also you're not distracted in the sense uh, mm -hmm. every 10 minutes you're shifting to a different segment uh, we usually only try to touch on two to three big segments uh, and then we really go deeper uh, into asking some of the tougher questions that, that we hope we can do from a student's perspective and then we try to uh, tie up the the, the 
conversation with some fun questions. But okay. uh, I think I think that's the important thing for us. Great. Just to tie a ribbon around this, um, and we'll get to the question on the screen in a second. But I'd like to bring Dave uh, back in real quick, just to to put a ribbon on this about um, the technical part of making a good podcast. I know Barry talked about a little bit about the room, but um, I just like to have our uh, our man Dave Hopkins talk about. Good podcast from a technical standpoint. Definitely. Um, one of the things that we've been seeing is where people get excited about doing it, but don't know really what's going on in the back end of it. So mm -hmm. um, the big part is just plan, 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 and prepare. be prepared to plan some more. Mm -hmm. um, and, then, and then once that preparation is ready, is done, then production becomes so much easier and shorter um, to do that part of it. Uh, and then it's, uh, you know, technically on the side of, you know, lining up the guests, um, doing some tests of the, whatever equipment's in place to make that work. Um, and of course, we've been seeing that's even more challenging now. It was easier when we could schedule time for people to come into the studio. Um, the and studio. The recording and just be here at that time. But now it's even another layer that we're adding on to that of, you know, does is their laptop up to up to the speed or the or can it handle any issues of, of, the, of the Internet? Um, being able to make the delivery of the content. So there's even more layers on top of that to add in the process of planning and, and being prepared for the worst of when things can happen and what are your backup plans to make those things work. Mm -hmm. um, that's been the key parts of, of that technically. Um, and then it's also, you know, how you're doing, how you're going to deliver your content and what uh, uh, systems you plan to store your, your files on so that they're um, constantly up and available. And if it goes viral, um, how, you know, what can those systems handle it? Can the website handle it that you're putting it on? And can the, ser the service that's storing your files handle that? So those are the type of things to keep in mind too in that part of the process. Great, thanks, Dave. So uh, let's take a question from the audience. Uh, Ayani Does Stuff, at Ayani Does Stuff, PhD candidate at UF asks, any suggestions on where independent shows can host episode files in order to link to locations like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, et cetera? Who'd like to handle this question? I mean, uh, I can speak to that quickly. Please do, Rose. We just made a shift to Libsyn. It's uh, short for Liberated Syndication. And I've been pretty pleased with their platform. Um, it actually was just picked up on Spotify on its own. Uh, and I did put it on Stitcher. But you do need to use a third party uh, source to store your files, which I think a lot of people don't know. I think they think that maybe you just go to iTunes and put them there directly. But you have to actually get your podcast approved through iTunes, mm -hmm. which can take anywhere between, I think, two days to three weeks or something like that. So right. keep that in mind if you're planning a series as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, when I submitted The Prince and Spark, I think it took exactly two weeks for them to approve it. And then most other places will pick it up. I think you have to submit it to Google for them to, to pick it up. And I believe Spotify as well. I did right. that just to make sure. But um, And Google takes the longest. Yes, Google takes the longest. Um, yeah, uh, here's the next question. Uh, how do you all feel about spontaneity in a podcast? I.e., do you supply questions ahead of time? Do you give just give guests a general topic and then hope for a nice dynamic conversation? Uh, let's go to you, Barry, on uh, your, this is like pre-interview prep. It depends on the guest and what you're, talking to them about. So for academics, it's spont spontaneity doesn't really work. You want them to present the best form of an answer about their work that they can. And have, allowing them to deliberate about it beforehand, know what the question is. Some guests insist on it. I've had guests write out their whole answers and just say to me, "Can I read this?" <laughs> and um, and and sometimes and you're like, "Okay, well that sucks. You want a spontaneous answer." Well, until you hear their spontaneous answer and they suck at it, right? And so if that's the case and they know themselves, right, and you insist on having this guest, then maybe that is the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. For subjects like sources, like a journalism side, something that happened to somebody, a story. Uh, you do want spontaneity. Uh, I might prep the question, but not send it to them. I might prep some questions. I might give them an outline. Um, the best tape that you get if you want to make a This American Life type show is the tape that is spontaneous. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. Um, if you do a chat show, um, then maybe like a panel kind of chat show thing, then you might want only spontaneity. But then again, it, you're leaving it all to talent and personality. And if you have the right talents and the right personality, spontaneity is the best way to go. And uh, it depends on the people. There's there's no one mm-hmm. rule because sometimes spontaneity leads to just something that's unlistenable. <laughs> yes, that's true. Uh, Margaret, uh, I'd like to hear your perspective on that. Um, you, yeah, you know, I, mean, I, I feel kind of strongly. I, I'd like to pick up on uh, the endorsement of spontaneity, which I I, I don't think can be overstated. Uh, I think, you know, I've been doing interviews for, for, for 25 years and it's always better when it's spontaneous. And I, I frankly never give questions in advance. I, I will sometimes give topics and tell people I'm going to touch on these topics. Mm-hmm. But for if somebody is an expert in their field, they can address in a, in a semi-spontaneous way pretty much any com- question you throw at them. And that's right. so much more, um, more interesting. If it follows a natural conversational tone, the, the, the answer is going to be so much more accessible. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm, I'm really rigid on that. I, I never give questions in advance. Mm-hmm. And often what I do actually is after the formal interview is over, I say, thank you very much. And then we start chatting and those are the best answers right. when they think the interview is over. Right. Those are by far the best answers. Right. Um, and again, that's for a particular format where you're going to be editing it afterwards. It's not a, a live, you know, live to tape kind of scenario. Mm-hmm. It's where you can go back and edit it. But you can hear the difference in their vocal cords. You can hear the difference in their muscles almost when they think that they're being, when they're more relaxed. Right. And podcasting, I think, is an intimate form. Uh, you know, you, your people are often listening in, in, on headphones. So the idea of projecting like, like university professors often want to do um, just doesn't come across well. It becomes hard to listen to, I think. Right. It's a little much and it goes over people's heads literally. Yeah. Okay, question from our friend Gwen McNamara. What are some tips for building interview skills, editing skills, storytelling skills in your podcasting team who may not come from a communications background? Um, so I'd like to, maybe uh, I, yeah, I Olin, can please, jump yes. in there. So yes. I don't come from a communications background, but um, I've listened to a lot of podcasts and uh, radio. And I think the f- number one thing I like the first thing is to stop listening to podcasts and radio passively. And that mm-hmm. by that, I mean, when you're listening to like BBC or something or this American life, don't just consume it as media, stop and ask, okay, what was the process behind this? Well, like, what would I need to make a cut like this? Like what, um, you know, just put yourself in the mindset of how do I actually make something like this rather than just listen to that. So that's number one. And I think, um, Sorry, was the the rest of the question? Yeah. So, um, interview skills, you just have to go out and do it, and you know, go out to people, like just go talk to people. And sometimes interviewing is it's a lot less scary than it sounds, um, especially if uh, like what we just heard, you have a natural conversation. So mm-hmm. I've been just giving very vague prompts to my guests, and mm-hmm. uh, kind of, you know, you, you, you do three or four and after like your fifth interview, you kind of have your own style kind of emerge. Right. Um, but it's not really something that you can just read up and go into it knowing that you're going to be hundred percent prepared. Um, so I guess number one, put yourself in the, you know, mindset of, okay, I'm not listening, I'm making. And number two is practice. So. That's a great answer because I feel like, um, that's what I had to do. Uh, it wasn't just listening passively to enjoy it. I had to say, okay, here's where the music starts and here's where it ends and here's when it dips in volume. And this is the feeling you get for when the music drops out. Yeah. And, and when you do that, I, I just realized that, you know, I'm listening to my material and then all the stuff that I would have thrown out actually is interesting. You know, the, the, the dial tone connections, you know, the little, Cross talk, all the stuff you can kind of sprinkle in there. Uh, that that's what I call like the uh, it, that's like the content that's interesting to your ear. Mm-hmm. It's not just interesting content wise, you know. So you, I find that you have to just it's all about adopting a new mindset and saying, okay, um, you know, like what you said, it's how do I produce this? Mm-hmm. What does it mean to 
think like a podcaster rather than a listener. Right. Uh, Rose, I'd like you to, to, to chime in on this one. I know you have uh, a team that you work with. This is actually just from the interviewing perspective, and I'll just really quickly say this, um, and maybe Margaret and others will agree. I found over the years of doing interviews, there's always a question that I'm afraid to ask because I don't want to appear stupid or like something like that. And it's right. it's usually the question that listeners or readers of stories have. So ask the question. Don't be afraid to ask it. Um, mm -hmm. You're not going to sound stupid. There are probably other people wondering the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. You do have a responsibility because you're representing the audience. and. Um, I know when, when someone doesn't ask the question that I want to know, and I feel like I missed something and that I feel like, oh, if I was there, I, I could have asked this and um, gotten some value out of the, some additional value out of the interview. So that's a great point. Uh, anyone else that want to chime in on that? I, I couldn't, couldn't agree more. Uh, you you really always want to ask the obvious question and 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 follow up also when somebody delivers information that is maybe a little bit um, <laughs> ahead of the game. You have to you want to dial it back and ask them to explain it. Don't be shy. I mean, it's really a case of don't be shy. Don't be afraid mm -hmm. of sounding dumb. And I guess the one tip, but this is like a you know one of those pro tips that you know use at your 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 risk is the why question always seems to be the question that gets a little bit of heart and soul ultimately. Why are you interested in that? Why do you do that? You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's not just what is happening, you know, what the information is that they need. Why is that important? Those are the questions I think over and over again that end up delivering the stuff that I end up not putting on the editing room floor and end up back in there because they give you the, not just the information, but the, 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 a bit of the personality of your, your interview guest, right. um, which is nice to hear. There's always a warmth in that kind of, you know, this is my personal reason for taking the action or, or saying the thing that I've said. Can I, can I just add one more thing to that? Please do. Um, so about the question, you know, about, you know, being scared to ask a certain question. Um, what I found effective is asking the interviewee to explain things on different levels. So like, you know, how would you explain this to a child? How would you explain this to a teenager? How would you explain this to a graduate student? Um, and then it kind of, you don't have to sound knowledgeable. It's more about how they explain it mm -hmm. rather than, oh, do they think that I understand what they're talking about? Cause that's not really what the point is. You can always edit out your stupid sounding question. And yes. if, if you're doing that kind of show, right? So it's really, you, you want to get them to explain things a, a few different ways. And sometimes I'm like, okay, can you explain that again? But just pretend I don't know what you're talking about. And mm -hmm sometimes they you know they have like a canned answer and they come out with something a lot more compelling mm -hmm. dave i'd like to ask you uh, go ahead you had something to that yeah i was just gonna also tie into what you're saying is that one of the uh, big pieces that we usually deal with is people who are technically nervous about things so it's like how is the microphone going to work how is this piece all, all these pieces coming together and that's where we recommend them coming in and doing practice sessions um, with the equipment and with how they think the script and everything will go, uh, because then that really helps to, to ease the comfort of not worrying about the technical parts of it and flow with the questions that are that are going to be asked to the guests. And that, that changes the whole mood of, of the actual interview. Sure, great. Another thing that people ask a lot is whether you wanna do your interviews in person or over the phone, and whether you wanna be seeing them. And that's such a personal thing. Um, uh, you know, I always like to see the people. I, I find it, you know, to, de to, uh, to de develop a, a really strong eye contact to me is where it helps with what Dave was just talking about, helps them zone out all of the other stuff and the, the nervousness. They're just talking to you. Mm -hmm. but Terry Gross famously um, uh, doesn't do them in person, um, really does them over the phone because she feels like that's how she gets her best um, uh, interviews. So mm -hmm. it, it's a personal thing, but it's worth thinking about. Mm -hmm. Uh, Neil, do we have time for one more question? Ding. Okay, then uh, I think we will bring this plane to a, a smooth landing. I'd like to thank Barry and Rose and David and Oleg and Margaret and Tiger for their participation. This was really great. I thought um, I learned so much. And um, 
Again, uh, James and I will put together a list of resources for our attendees, uh, including the things that were mentioned here, including uh, Roadcaster and Heil and Libsyn and all the other things. And one other thing that I had to remember to bring was the book that I used to help me get started. Um, this is uh, So You Want to Start a Podcast with Kristen, by Kristen Meindler on the Buy the Book podcast. And it's a really nice um, sort of everything to, to do or everything to think about when you're starting a podcast. I read it in one sitting and I'm not a reader at all. And my wife got this for me and uh, I read it in like two hours or something. And it had uh, it finding your voice, telling your story and building community that will listen. So a lot of good tips in that. Um, I'm not paid to promote this, but thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you so much to all of our panelists and our moderator for sharing their tips and tricks on podcasting. Uh, we're, we're looking forward to seeing everyone at our closing keynote for the Grad Futures Forum, featuring a fireside chat with Princeton PhD alumna Ann Kirshner, a Princeton trustee, educator, author, entrepreneur, and veteran of four startups. She'll have a conversation with Sri Srinivasan, a digital media expert and journalism professor at Stony Brook University at 4.30 p.m. Ann and Sri will have a conversation covering the future of graduate education, the importance of professional development and exposure to diverse career paths, what we've learned and where we go from here. We're looking forward to seeing you all. And again, a big virtual round of applause for all of our panelists and our moderator and all that we learned about podcasting this afternoon. Thank you all. <laughs>